It's uh, 701 and we have a quorum. So I'm going to call the February 25th, 2021 <clears throat> meeting of the advisory committee to order. Uh, this meeting is being held remotely as an alternative means of public access pursuant to an order issued by the governor of Massachusetts dated March 12th, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. Any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start of the meeting in accordance with Mass General Laws, chapter 30A, section 20F, so that the chair may inform all other participants of said recording. The advisory committee is having this meeting recorded. Is there any participant who is also uh, recording of this meeting? If so, please identify yourself uh, by the raise hand function and let me know. I am not seeing anyone. So um, we will proceed to our first agenda item, which are comments from the public on items not on the agenda. Is there any member of the public that has a comment on this at this point on some matter that is not on the agenda. If so, please use the raise hand function and identify yourself by name and address to the chair. I am not seeing anybody, so I think there are no public comments. So we will go on to our uh, next item on the agenda. Um, is, is Libby here? Yes. Yes. Okay. I just wasn't seeing you while you were on the second screen. So we have the repurposing of capital funds for purchase of hybrid police cruisers. Is the chief present or? He is not. He has two other meetings tonight and asked me to present this on his behalf. Okay. I'm, happy to, I'm happy to do so now or if I don't know if there's any other people here for any article hearings, if you'd rather do it at the end, um, whatever's most convenient. I, I think you're probably going to make an efficient statement concerning this. Yes. So I think we might as well go ahead. Okay. So um, this uh, repurposing request is for fiscal 21. Um, and just for purposes of information, the current budget that we reviewed for fiscal 22 is a no buy year. Um, and every year we ask them about um, the possibility of looking at, at hybrid vehicles. And so the chief uh, looked into this and um, identified, I have to see if I have the file open, the um, Ford uh, Cruiser that is now um, made in a hybrid version. And the state, I think, has over 200 of these. Um, vehicles. Um, so if you look at, I, I, if you all um, have that letter that the chief wrote to um, the Board of Selectmen, um, what the, the numbers are is that the total cost of the seven cruisers for this fiscal year 21 um, is $13,131 higher than the budgeted amount. Um, and that portion, so that is uh, coming from the evidence room update which was put on hold due to the potential changes at town hall um, and the potential of a future public safety facility. So um, that initial 13,131 is coming from there with an additional $500 and the automated uh, defibrillators are, um, they originally thought they had a useful life of five years. It turns out it's 10. So they spoke to the manufacturer and with proper maintenance, those um, defibrillators can last 10 years. So what they wanna repurpose is $24,000 from the automated defibrillators um, with the remaining 13,631 coming from the evidence room update. And that will allow them to uh, purchase seven of these hybrid um, cruisers, which are more fuel, ultimately, they're a little more money up front, 
um, but they will over the long term save in fuel and obviously also are more environmentally friendly and um, so I think that's everything. Okay, and under our town procedures, the Board of Selectmen and the Advisory Committee <clears throat> need to approve this repurposing. And capital and, outlay. And capital outlay. Yeah, and the, they did. And both capital outlay and the Board of Selectmen have voted in favor of this repurposing. Yes, unanimously. Right. Okay. And so are there uh, any members of the Advisory Committee that have a question? Nancy. Thanks, Bob. Um, I just had a question about the fuel cost savings. Yes. Not annual and for in congregate. Um, that savings, I believe, is um, it looks to be an aggregate. It seems like that's a high number, but you know what? I'm going to say that's probably annual because they use a lot of fuel. Yeah, on the road in, in place. It's impressive. That's. Yeah, I think they use a lot of fuel in um, in the police vehicles. Davaline is a an additional um, liaison to capital. Does that do, do you concur with my? Yes. Yeah. It, the fuel savings are part of what really convinced him, as well as uh, the police chief, as well as his conversations with other people in the Commonwealth. Uh, two hundred about two hundred state troopers use these, and these are actually police vehicles. They're not sort of an SUV that gets changed into, these are actual, Ford is now producing these as their police vehicles. So, and I, do, so the, but the 4381 in fuel, because the CO2 is says annual report per vehicle. I wonder if is the 4381, yeah. but you think that's an aggregate? I think, I think that's an annual number um, per vehicle. I can confirm that. Wow, with the chief. that's impressive. Um, but I mean, they use, um, it, as you know, the, it's really about the idle hours on a lot of the vehicles and they are constantly idling. Um, one other thing I, I wanted to mention is that also they did consult with some of the neighboring communities and uh, they are also using these vehicles and they are very, very happy with their performance. Thank you. Looks Any like George questions? has a question, Bob. Who had a question? George. I do, Bob. George. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, so, Libby, um, if these vehicles will last 10 years, does that mean that um, we will change the uh, uh, the repurchasing cycle from seven to closer to 10? Um, yeah, I mean, that would definitely be... Um, be what they would be, you know, what the police department would look to do, yeah. Okay. Other members of the advisory committee with a question? So, so Libby, um, so the, this is just one set of seven vehicles that are originally, yes. okay, and it was originally going to be just replaced with a regular vehicle, which wouldn't yes. need the extra capital anyway because of the cost shortfall or the cost, the higher cost. Yes. That right, and then, okay. Yes. Yeah, the additional cost is because per per vehicle it's more expensive. But again, the payback on that savings um, or that the payback on the, that additional cost is um, is very short term. Libby, is it the intention to make the entire fleet hybrid? Um, I think that that would be the intent. Um, but obviously, this is the first time they're doing this. Um, but in speaking with, like as I said, even just the lo some other. Um, neighboring communities that have used them, they, they, they're really happy with the performance. So um, I think that they may have certain vehicles that for some reason they may feel this, these aren't appropriate for, um, but I can't imagine that the ultimate um, goal would not be to have the whole fleet be um, hybrids. Any other questions or further discussion? Are people prepared to vote? Why not? Uh, you want to make a motion, Libby? Absolutely. So I would like to make a motion that a total of, actually, let me just. So a total of, 
$37,631 of capital uh, is repurposed from the evidence room update and the automa automated defibrillators um, for the purchase of seven hybrid cruisers. Second. Um, all right, so we'll have a roll call vote. George? Aye. Aveline? Aye. Brenda? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Dave? Aye. Libby? Aye. Julie? Aye. Alan? Aye. Victor? Aye. Evan? Aye. Andy? Aye. And Tina? Aye. And Aaron? Happy birthday, you arrived. Did you, were you in time to hear the discussion and, and vote? Erin, you're on mute. Of course I am, sorry about that. Um, I am, was, did not hear the conversation, no. So I will abstain. Okay, all right. So I think we're 1301. But I've got. And Bob. Yes. I wonder if during, um, I'm looking at the list of articles that we have to hear, and I notice that the Harbor Master is on the line, um, and his article is fairly straightforward. Is there any way that we could move him up the, uh, the list there, since it's a fairly expedient article? Are there other folks here as presenters on behalf of an article? Uh, is there Judy, here Sneath. On that? Judy Sneath is here. On uh, Route Three A, which is la later why don't we on. Take those, why don't we take those two articles first? If if we have actual presenting proponents here, and um, <clears throat> that would be great. I appreciate yes. it, Bob. I, Bob, I'm just going to see if Jr. can join now because I think he expected us to be a little later on your agenda. So. Uh, well, we can always wait till JR um, is available. And, I think I can get him because I know that we'd like to stay in, in your queue. So, okay. I'll, well, since, I'll, be, I'll try to be ready as soon as Ken is finished. Okay. Since Waterways is on first, we'll go with Waterways. And I think that's you, Libby, again. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Bob. Um, I see our Harbor Master Ken Corson has joined us. And um, so what Article W does is, um, is if, as I put in the comment, if you recall in 2019, um, the annual meeting, we established the new Municipal Waterways Improvement and Maintenance Fund. Um, there were some predecessor funds to this, um, which were consolidated into this new fund. And in the last dredging cycle that was just done, um, those two funds, one was a capital dredging fund and another way, another one was a waterways fund. They were both, um, those final funds that were in there were, uh, well, the waterways fund was able to be transferred into this new fund and you cannot do that with the capital funds. <clears throat> so that last dredging cycle zeroed out, um, the dr capital dredging account and then, um, uh, used what was in the waterways. So, as of 2019's town meeting, we, this fund's been established. And what this article is seeking to do is, um, is to deposit some additional amounts that are not part of the statutory requirements of the Mass General Law Chapter 40. And what that would be is the remaining half of the boat excise tax, which is approximately 35,000. Revenues from the parking um, lease that is $40,000 and revenues that are generated by the um, Harbor Master's Office, which is uh, permit late fees and boat fines, which is projected to be about $10,000. Um, it's, I believe, Sue indicated it's $7,600 as of today or a couple days ago. Um, but we're going to just use that projection of $10,000 because the Harbor Master did indicate that it is um, there are more fines that we uh, that he um, collected during fiscal 21. Um, that total is $85,000. And then I just noted um, below there about um, what these funds are, um, the use uh, appropriation limitations on the use of these funds. 
And so this is just a um, further attempt to get harbor related revenues into deposited into this uh, improvement and maintenance fund so that when we have the next dredging cycle, or again, if you look at the other, other purposes that these funds can be used for, it's not just dredging, but it's maintenance, um, dredging, cleaning, and improvement of the harbors. It's um, retaining walls, uh, piers, wharves, and whatnot. So um, the goal here is to just consolidate all har harbor revenues into this fund. So um, I think that's the gist of the article. Ken, is there something that you would like to add or? I don't have anything um, specific to add. I think you did a great job of explaining what this is. Um, I guess the only thing I would like to say is um, dredge, our next dredging cycle is only eight years away at this point. Um, so it's important that we start saving now so that when we get to that point, we have some money in the reserves. Um, obviously we'll always do the same thing. We always do apply for grants and so forth to minimize the town's expense, but it's important to have this money in the waterways fund and reserve should there not be any grant opportunities or should dredging cost a lot more than it has in the past. And we were really lucky this past dredging cycle where we came with, we had a, a contractor that came with a really great bid. Um, so we haven't spent a lot of money, but it's important that we put these monies in the reserve so that we, we have them. Um, I wanna point out that this is not my article. This is a board of selectmen article. And I'm just here to um, help move it through the process and answer any questions. And I know one thing I just want to point out to my colleagues is that, um, and particularly the editors, you'll notice that in the last paragraph of the comment, I, I in the first line, I did indicate a partial funding. Um, the reason I did that was um, I, I didn't want somebody reading this to walk away thinking that, what we're saying is that that fund will entirely pay for the statutory appropriations of this particular chapter um, of the Mass General Law. And, and as Ken referenced, um, we often, and the reason that this was established was to be able to apply for grants. So it's also for the purpose of, of applying for grants, but um, you know, as we know from the article a couple of years ago, there actually was an appropriation um, that was requested. So I just didn't want, as, as this article stands on its own and someone to read that, to think that we're insinuating that, that the um, entirety of what's in that imp waterways improvement and maintenance fund would be sufficient to pay for future dredging. Um, so it's, it seems, it, it's just one word, but I feel like it's important because it kind of indicates that um, there's some possibility other funds would be required. And that's it. Libby, Libby I have this question. Um, yeah. In the recommended motion, yes. rather than uh, approximating an amount, uh, could we instead say that we're putting in all of X funds, all of Y funds and half of Z funds which are estimated to be approximately $85,000. So that if the number changes, it's completely clear as to the total amounts or you know, one half of one of the categories is gonna go into the waterways fund. Sure, I, I have no problem doing that. I, I kind of looked at the previous warrant um, when this was, um, which I think was the 2019, and, and I thought that we used the same, this similar language, but I thought rather than breaking it down, because if you notice this, the, recommend, the recommended motion is in sync with the, um, the question, and they, um, I wanted to keep it as in sync with, with that without um, really kind of, I guess, um, swaying too far from that. But if you'd like me to do that, I'm more than happy to. Well, what do other people think? I agree with you entirely, Bob. I don't think we should vote something that says we authorize um, transfer of approximately any amount. I, think, uh, I, I agree as well. Okay, we will do. Nancy, you had a question? Oh, I just had a comment. I think the um, 85,000 though is something, oh, I'm sorry. I, I withdraw it. I was going to say I, that it should be in the comment because I do think that we, people should know the order of magnitude. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with 
uh, putting it, say, in parentheses in their recommended motion, you know, estimated to be $85,000 or leaving it in the comment. Okay. No I problem. just think uh, it's a simple, theoretically. It's a simple change. I can make that. Yeah. Okay. And um, Andy, do you have a question? I, I was going to raise the issue you just raised. Okay. Uh, your hand is still up. So, <laughs> um, any other um, questions from members of advisory? Uh, I'm trying to trying to remember, Bob. Um, last year, did we use some of this money for for budget purposes? I'm trying to. Remember. Yes, yeah. we did, Victor. The um, the other half, these actually all three of these amounts, let me just see that parking and yeah, they all go into local receipts. So this, th these three non statutory components. So again, the statutory portion that I mentioned in paragraph one, those all by, by, by law, they have to go into that fund. These are the non statutory pieces that last year um, were not done. So I had recommended when I did the articles in 2019, all the all the harbor ones and the dredging and the fun this these fun ones that you know this kind of become a perennial article. So for all those adcom members that will be on here long after those are our ter us have terms that end, um, you know it, it's it's something that ultimately is in the hands of the selectmen whether it's going to be or not. But I think given the high cost of dredging and harbor uh, maintenance required, it would behoove us to make this a perennial warrant article and set these funds aside. Yeah, that was the original plan in 2019, right? But the, and then last year we had good intentions, but decided yeah. we needed the money for other things. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, any other questions for comments from members of the advisory committee? Any, uh, Andy, you had another question. Well, uh, uh, <clears throat> Isn't this a year where we need the money for other things? We're talking about a $4 million deficit. Well, I think ultimately the article was put forth by the selectmen. So it's our job to, to complete it and ultimately town meetings decision as to whether they approve it or not. I would say that $85,000 is not gonna make a big difference and and that um i i think like investing money in capital it is a good and prudent idea for the reasons already expressed mm -hmm. to accumulate this fund for the dredging that is going to happen in the future if during the budget discussions when we sort of come to the end of the line um we so assume we vote this tonight favorably. Um, during the budget discussions, if we say, hey, we really do need that $85,000 for whatever. Um, I suppose, Bob, we could reopen this recommendation, couldn't we? I, I think that's true. I think we generally review, well, we certainly review all the budgets. Um, you know, I I would think that's on the table if 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 necessary. I think we do that, yeah. So would you like a, oh. I I well I I think people would probably prefer to see the revised written motion before we vote it. Um, uh, does that would would people just as soon see the revised written motion? No. I'm good. Yeah, I would prefer to see the revised written motion. I, I think it makes sense, Libby, for us to vote this next Tuesday. Okay. Uh, once we have the revised motion. Otherwise, we're going to review the revised motion in any event. And Ken, can I ask you if um, <clears throat> it wasn't on our Warren article summary sheet, but did the, the selectmen, did they vote this on the 11th of February? I'm not sure if they voted this on the 11th of February. Okay, I can follow up with Julie on that. Um, because they did. Uh, and off the top of my head, I don't recall. They did, Nancy. They did, and it's three zero. Uh, 
I, I thought okay. it was voted and that's why it, it made its way onto our agenda tonight. That's what I thought th so too. So, okay, yeah. so it was unanimous with the selectmen. All right, I'll revise that comment and we can do that on Tuesday. And I don't think you probably have to come back, Ken, but you're more than welcome to join us if you have nothing else to do on Tuesday night. And we'd, be we'd be delighted to have you, but it's entirely unnecessary for you to be here. Um, and I should ask, are there any members of the public that have any questions on this? And I don't see any hands or other signs that there are. So, so we have concluded our hearing on this. We can have further discussion if necessary and uh, we'll vote it on Tuesday night. Thank you, Ken. You're welcome, thank you. Glad we got you in and out of here. I appreciate it. And at this point, um, we will also take Article X, the Route 3A Rotary Summer Street Carter Roadway Improvements uh, out of order as we have uh, uh, live proponents who are here. Uh, I think this is George and Tina's to present. And thank you, JR and Judy for being here. And Alan Perrault. And Alan Perrault. All right, Alan. I wasn't sure whether you were here on waterways or or the Route 3A. Good, always good to see you. Thanks. Well, thank you, Bob. And it's great to see such representation from the committee, Judy. Uh, I think it's just speaks volumes of the work you're doing and the interest you have in, in seeing this project go through the advisory committee this evening. So um, without further ado, um, uh, I will remind um, the members of the committee that have been around for a few years that this is uh, probably an article that you have seen before in one way, shape, or form. Um, this article started um, in 2014, and, uh, and we, we voted again in 2019, and uh, we're here now for which is, what is hopefully the final vote on this article. Uh, the 3A um, uh, task force is here to present some information, um, but I would say that, that I think most of us are familiar with the issues surrounding 3A, the traffic congestion, um, particularly at the Rotary, um, which will be replaced by a roundabout. Um, and there will also be some lanes restructuring uh, for North Street um, turns um, going um, headed north and also for Water Street um, headed north. Um, in addition to that, there will be um, um, bicycle uh, and, and walkways built. Uh, so it'll really be a, a very nice um, addition to the harbor area. And, uh, and we've invited uh, Judy and JR and Alan to, uh, to give us a little more update on the, on the project. Um, and I'll turn it over to Judy at this point. Thank you, George. Um, I am going to share my screen and um, that will just take one second. If I can, can I share my screen? Uh, Tyler, can, can, you, can you make Judy Sneath a co-host so she can share her screen? She is now, so. It says host disabled, let's see. You're, you're okay. listed on my participants as a co-host. Yes, I just, so. I got the notice, okay. um, so. I'm going to, do you see the, um, the, the slide of Otis Street, Summer Street, Rockland Street? Yes. Yeah. Without my words? No, we, or we see the words as well. Okay. Um, I am notoriously bad at this, so I apologize um, for that. Excuse me. Tyler, can you help her out with this? Not yeah, so I made you co-host. You should be able to share a screen and then um, you had it shared for a second there. Oh, her issue isn't the sharing of the screen. She has some text that yeah. oh, wait. she's using. You, probably, for, you want to share the slideshow, but not the text. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, you know text, text that you're receiving? I'm going to just wing it and uh, you'll, you'll know when I, um, just, I don't remember what I was going to say. So can, can you just put it on, just put it on slideshow. I'm just going to put it on slideshow. I'm just going to put it on slideshow. How many teachers? Okay. Um, okay. Here I go. 
and I'm putting you got this. Blood, such a, mm -hmm. okay, you see the whole, Oops. you see everything, right? Um, so it's like having a narrative. So um, this is, I'm going to give you a brief overview, especially since George really uh, gave you a little bit of a heads up on, on what we've um, been doing, and you probably know. Uh, the project extends from the turnoff of Otis Street just by uh, the Lobster Pound all the way east to Rockland Street and George Washington Boulevard. Through the, road, through the Rotary, the Bathing Beach, and the North Street um, intersection. So that's just where we are. The, uh, safety, the, the most important part of this project is that it's a safety improvement project. Um, and then it's a long list of concerns. I'll go through quickly. High crash rates, uh, wrong intersection geometrics, excessive speed through the area. Uh, limited pedestrian connections, substandard sidewalks, lack of bicycle accommodations, insufficient roadways. So here we are. This is what's, um, what's come before us tonight. In 2009, the Board of Selectmen started talking about alternative improvements to the Route 3A rotary because there was high crash rate there. In 2013, um, MassDOT conducted a road safety audit for Summer Street from North Street uh, to Hull, identifying safety issues. In 2014, the town asked um, the Central Transportation staff, CTPS, I think it's called, uh, to conduct a corridor study. That was completed in the, um, as George said, we went to town meeting in 2015 for funding for design funds, and this project actually started in uh, 2016. Um, we are now at the point we, where we have submitted what they call 25% designs <clears throat> to the state. We're talking to the state about resolving all of the issues uh, Excuse me, Judy, for a minute. Uh, I, I can't read these that that slide. Uh, uh, can you just hit the slideshow? That's, a, yeah, that's it. Thank you. There you go. Right. So um, here we are. We've submitted the twenty-five percent design. We are in the process with the state of resolving the issues that they identified in that initial submission. We're working towards 75% design this year and should have final plans in 2022. We are on the state transportation improvement program, their budget for 2025. So I'm just gonna tell you a tiny bit about the project and then we'll get back to the finances. The, the most noticeable difference along this corridor is that there will be sidewalks, shoulders, and shared use path really from end to end. So the connection between the Crow Point neighborhood and the uh, Martins Lane neighborhood and Hall will be dramatic. You can take a bike or a walk from one end to the next safely with uh, buffers between pedestrians, bicyclists, and the lanes of traffic. This is just one um, uh, page from Landscape um, Architects Designs. Uh, you can see this is leading down to the harbor where this tree is on the left, uh, grassy area, uh, the harbor path that's there now is connecting to this project. So we've really um, been able to incorporate all the work that's been done on the harbor. Um, and as you move along uh, to the other side, you'll see uh, the 10 foot path, the sidewalk, the uh, five foot buffer, and then the roadway. And on, then another sidewalk on the other side of the street. So that's gonna be pretty consistent along the entire length of <coughs> the project. Now I'm gonna just tell you about two of the primary uh, changes. The first is at the North Street intersection, which is in my mind, the really centerpiece of this project. By doing this, we're gonna be connecting the uh, 
Hingham downtown commercial area with the harbor and just opening up all kinds of possibilities for interaction, for economic development, and um, for just enjoyment of the harbor. The um, If you look up where the words North Street are, that 10 foot shared use path has come from the um, from Otis Street down by the culvert <laughs> all the way to here. When it gets to this point where you see the uh, circle, it will go into two parts. And we had to do that because of this small uh, geometry at North Street. Um, so the uh, one side of the path will go behind Red Eye Roasters and use the current pedestrian bridge that we invested in over to the Whitney Wharf, um, uh, Whitney Wharf. And then a five foot path will continue along as a sidewalk along um, Otis Street until it gets to that intersection. At that point, the sidewalk opens up so that pedestrians coming from North Street and crossing will land on a 10 foot wide area, which if anybody has ever crossed that street, you know that that is an incredible um, improvement. And then that 10 foot uh, shared use path uh, continues uh, once it connects over here. As George pointed out on, um, so on, it's called Summer Street here, on Route 3A itself, when traffic is heading from Hull up towards Boston, there are two lanes of traffic now. With this project, there will be a third lane which will be designated for turns onto Water Street and North Street. So for traffic leaving Hull, there'll be considerable improvement in the flow of traffic, not having to wait um, as cars turn onto the two streets. The second primary feature of this uh, project is that the rotary uh, is being shrunk in size to what is known as a roundabout. Roundabouts are smaller in size, um, slower in speed and better marked so that it's clear to uh, drivers where they're coming in and leaving the, um, the roundabout. You can see on the top side of this screen that because of the reduction in size of the rotary, we have tons of space here for the, that 10 foot shared use path to continue through the area uh, to have benches, uh, bike um, racks, and um, additionally, pedestrian crosswalks throughout uh, all the way around the roundabout. So that, um, again, a big connector to Green Street to um, and up to the Martins Lane area. Uh, and as a result of that road diet that we all saw in 2018, this stretch of roadway that leads from the roundabout out to Hall will be one lane in each direction all the way up to the Martins Lane traffic light. That will be a significant safety improvement for pedestrians, bicyclists, and just, um, you know, and vehicles. The crash rate in that particular area was uh, well above the state average and was a primary driver for um, having the road diet and, and for this project uh, in all. So where are we right now? Um, you can all see yourselves at the bottom of my screen. I'm gonna lower you. Um, the, in 2015, town meeting approved phase one design expense we then contracted with DCI, the engineering firm, uh, and that was $400,000 for phase one design. The estimated cost of construction at that point of the project was $7.5 million, and the anticipated design fee would then translate to 6.5%. In 2017, we um, had to make up an additional $24,000 on top of the 400 to offset additional DCI costs related to that pilot road diet, which involved uh, design coordination with the state, a lot of public hearings, coordinations with the public safety chief, chiefs in all three uh, towns that use that rotary. So in 2019, now the scope of this project has become more complex because we 
uh, kind of entered the world of uh, Massachusetts complete streets. Originally, this was going to be focused on the roadway. Um, Massachusetts does not allow that. You have to build the complete street with the shared use path and the sidewalks, and it all has to comply with their standards. Additionally, we added a small piece of the project on the Western side um, over the culvert, which made sense to connect with the Crow Point neighborhood. So because of those design changes to pilot pro the pilot program, we requested another $195,000. So, so far we've spent $619,000. This year we've come back another $200,000. Um, and that $200,000 is represents 5.4%. So a lower percentage of the estimated construction cost. The project is now estimated by the state um, at $5.3 million, $15.3, sorry, million dollars on the TIP, on the Transportation Improvement um, Program. So um, the, yeah. So that's what, so this two hundred thousand dollars will get us through to complete construction. If they're the, in order to uh, get a state construction project, and these are basically federal funds that the state allocates, uh, a town has to supply the design for the project. So if we don't complete the design, the project won't get built. Um, so my sense of this is that this is an incredibly um, great project for the town of Hingham, a $15 million investment in federal and state funds and uh, at a reasonable 5.4% of the design cost on our part. So if you have questions, Alan and JR will answer them. <laughs> <laughs> George, Allen or JR, did you have anything to add? Um, the only thing I would add, Bob, is uh, I think Judy did a, as the chair has done an outstanding job in this project. There were five members on the committee, uh, four others other than Jude, Paul Healy, former selectman, currently on CBA, Deidre Anderson, who largely was one of the biggest proponents getting this off the ground with the first 400,000. Uh, Bryce Blair, who lives off of Pro Point, and myself, who's kind of the liaison for the Bathing Beach Trustees and Harbor Development, if you will. So, and what Judy did is we broke it up. So each of us was kind of the champion of a different section. So I think the town, to Judy's point, we're getting a lot of bang for our buck here. So beyond just the roadway transportation project, we were looking at how do we improve pedestrian access from Crow Point, which originally was not in the scope, um, all the way to George Washington Boulevard. So we had proponents within our committee of that. And I think that's why we have a better project. And um, I think at the end of the day, um, you largely take these through the 75% design. It's a little bizarre how it works with the state. So you, you're probably thinking, well, if we're at 25%, is that not, not a lot of money to get the whole project through? You largely get it to 75% design and then the state picks it up from that point on. Jay, can correct me if I'm wrong, but so a lot of our money is already spent. We're just trying to have enough money to deal with right-of-way issues, any easements, other things that may come up so there's no surprises. So that's about it. Okay, well, certainly want to thank the entire committee for the years of incredible work you've done for this improvement. Uh, I only have one question, which is, um, I see the funding sources available funds. So George, is it your understanding this is coming out of fund balance? Uh, that would be my guess, but I, I don't have any definite knowledge of that. Okay, and I see that Andy has his hand up. Yeah, I have just a couple of quick uh, questions on the, uh, the, the changing the rotary into a roundabout, <clears throat> it's, you end up reducing uh, traffic on uh, 3A to one travel lane in each direction, cor correct? The roundabout is actually two two lanes. It, the roundabout remains two lanes. So the, the reduction in lane is from the roundabout up to Martin's lane. 
All right, so you come out of the roundabout with one lane. Is that right? Yes, it is. If you're headed towards Hull. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm going in the opposite direction, heading towards Hingham from Hull. So then you, uh, at Martin's Lane traffic light, traffic merges to one lane. Yeah. You come into the roundabout. Actually, right at, when you get to the roundabout, the there's an opening. So there are actually two lanes right at the end going yep. into the roundabout so that people can get into the appropriate lane depending on where they're going. When you come out the other side, uh, heading into downtown Hingham, you are back into two lanes. You are into two lanes again. Yes, which okay. soon opens up to three lanes because of that turning at water and north. Okay, now, and what about, uh, will, the, will there be a left-hand turn permitted into that gas station? Um, yes, we're not changing the way things are yeah, that's, there right that, now. That, that's quite a hazard, frankly. But Yeah, yeah. I, and, and when the, the traffic study shows that very few people make that turn, um, and we were, uh, yes, so we were hesitant yeah. to change any access to businesses as they exist today. Okay. Um, the, uh, uh, I would have uh, two suggestions. One is uh, in the comment section, if you want comments on the comment or, or, or does that come later, Bob? No, go ahead. All right, the, the, the last uh, two sentences. It, it's uh, too early. Uh, say again. All right, the last two sentences of the first paragraph of the comment, the current construction estimate for the project is 15.3 million. At current projections, the town will pay 5.4% of construction costs. Are, are you saying that the costs uh, for the total project of 15.3 and that the 819 roughly that the town is paying is its 5.4% contribution? Yes. Okay, that, that I would suggest that those sentences be reworded to make that uh, a little more uh, clear. Um, and the same uh, over on uh, the next page, the, the uh, second to last um, paragraph, begins the remaining 75% design documents. And I, I, that, that's a phrase I'm not familiar with. So I, uh, I'm wondering if you can change it to the remaining 75% design document submission or de design submission. But, uh, but then continuing on and it says after et cetera, continue to be derived through interaction, et cetera. I, I don't understand what that means. The remaining 25% design documents, blah, 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 continue to be derived through interaction. Uh, Andy, I'm not sure where you are on the comment. The second last paragraph. Second to the last. Paragraph that starts the remaining 75%. Okay. What, what's the phrase continue to be derived through mean? Doesn't it mean that there's just cooperation between the state, Hingham, and probably the federal government as well? I think that's what I was trying to say, and I guess I didn't say it very clearly, that um, when we were talking about this, there's there's all sorts of things that they, the committee was talking about, how they have to make changes and they have to continue to interact with the state and with local, um, and they're, there are changes that come up. I guess I just didn't say it very clearly. Tina, you could just say continue to be coordinated with. Yeah. Yeah, that that would uh, that would be fine. And uh, and this two hundred thousand is the last that the town is going to have to pay for this. Don't yes. We hope. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. So, I mean, I I I think. You know, you've done remarkable work, and this is a tremendous uh, deal for the town. And I just don't think it's made as clear in the comment as it as it could be that what a good deal it is. 
Yeah. And I would I would add when you ask, would this be the end? This is the end of the design um, money that we need for this project. There's something called um, exclude exclusions. No, Ellen, what do they call them? Uh, Non-covered expenses. So, for example, if the state puts in silver traffic lights and the town of Hingham decides we really want historic traffic lights, um, the there's, there's a difference in the expense, and we would have to pay for that difference in the expense. We have no idea of knowing right now what that would be. Sure. Um, so that's the only unanticipated amount of money associated with this project. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Alan says she ended up and then Julie. I just wanted to understand the answer to the question you asked, at Bob, which was the, the source of the 200000 There's a There's an impact in the FY22 budget of 200000 and that comes from reserves, you said. But so was that captured somewhere in what we've looked at? Available funds, which would indicate to me it's from fund balance. Couldn't hear you, Bob. Um, where it says it comes from available reserves. And that would indicate to me that the funding source is from fund balance. So, is there a recommended motion? On the version I have doesn't have a recommended motion. Yeah, I sent I sent out an updated version. That was my bad. Yeah, there was a late late breaking uh, uh, addition with uh, uh, with the motion that also changed the article from Q to X. Yeah. Um, you probably have the article Q I one. Have Q. Yeah, I have the old yeah. one. And, and, and the recommended motion does say an amount not in excess of 200000 from available reserves. So there's no impact on the $4.5 million that we're carrying at the moment, the deficit? I don't know the answer to that, but I believe that there is. I, I don't know that uh, the forecast group has included the amounts from um, warrant articles that are voted um, in the hit to fund balance. Bob, I think uh, just based on looking at the model today, I think that that is not included in the in the four and a half. Yeah, that's, that's my, my understanding. That yeah, that I would agree one with of you. The that's my impression. That, that that could drive up the number, right? Um, uh, because you know they just haven't added up what the warrant article hit is going to be on fund balance. Is that your memory from our discussions with uh, Tom and Michelle and Sue, Julie? Yes, I'm, I'm trying to remember, but I'm pretty sure that we don't have it tallied up. But, but we, may know, we may already need our 85 grand back. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if it comes so, out so of Bob, fund, are you saying that all warrant articles at this stage that are potentially funded from uh, coming from fund balance. None of those are currently reflected on the forecast because obviously That's, they haven't been they haven't been approved yet. That is my understanding. Okay. If you That's guys just to help reinforce that, if you look at the forecast we got yesterday, there's a last line item right above the words total appropriation that says other articles, and that's a zero. And that's if I recall correctly, that's typically the uh, line item that captures the. Uh, fund balance draws from other articles that are go before town meeting. Thank you, Dave. Yep. Uh, other questions from members of advisory? Julie. I'm waving my hand because as a co-host, I don't, I, I can't see how I can raise my hand like officially. Oh. So um, click, click on participants at the bottom. No, I know how to do that if like I'm set up regularly, but I got oh, okay. set up as a co-host tonight. So anyway, whatever. Um, the um, the project is one of those projects where you like want it today. It looks so good, um, so it's exciting. But what I hadn't been following is um, closely until now is the um, you know the the payments over the years and how basically because of the plan and what the state has um, asked us to include that the price has gone up. But um, I'm, I, I'm sort of kind of jumping on to what Andy McElhaney was asking questions about um, in the comment at the end of the first paragraph, when it says the town will pay 5.4% of the construction costs. Um, does that mean that when, when we're at, we're, we're ready to go from the tip in 2025, we're going to be 
have an article at a town meeting to pay that 5.4 or is the 5.4 percent of the construction cost all this design money that we're we've been paying to date the latter okay great i would recommend taking those two sentences out we're just sort of i mean you want to know how much it costs as a total i think that's important but i don't want people to think that that we're going to town meeting in 2025 or whatever and asking for more money that this is now you know good question yeah i read it i know that um in the printing of the warrant that they're not keen on tables but i i feel like um judy's slide was really helpful in understanding the numbers here in a way that a paragraph isn't so i don't know if there's a way to incorporate that information just visually differently well, couldn't that paragraph just be changed to say that with the addition of this $200,000, that brings the total design cost paid by the town of Hingham to $816,000, which represents 5.4% of the estimated future construction costs? Well, I'd say we, we just the total total cost of the project because there's a confusion between design and construction in, in my mind. And, and, but I, I, so that can be re, rewarded, I think, just to make it clear that in the other paragraph. Uh, the, only, uh, the, the only other comment I have is, um, Judy, will you please get the name of this road changed to Route 3A all along so I can finally understand when people talk about Lincoln Street and uh, Otis Street and I, I think that's street. beyond the scope of the agenda tonight. Then we wouldn't be in Massachusetts uh, anymore. It well, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's peculiar it, to Hingham, frankly. It, the, it, the it is beyond name. the scope. It's beyond the scope of the agenda for tonight. Thank you. Uh, David, well, can I ask one comment quickly? Yeah, go ahead, JR. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, I want to be uh, very clear about one of the things that Judy was trying to explain earlier, which was the non-participating agreement elements uh, of the contract. And basically, the town is only responsible for paying for the design. And once we get into base construction costs, um, the state pays for all of those expenses. However, there may be specific de design elements to enhance uh, the aesthetic appearance of the finished product that the town will elect to enter into a non-participatory, a non-participating contract uh, with the contractor. And it's usually done as an adult uh, an ad alternate to the construction contract so that the town will know exactly what that upcharge might be. For those elements, we may come back to town meeting uh, to request additional funding for those specific pieces uh, of construction. But th that's at the town's um, behest at that point. Okay, thank you. David Lee, you had a question? So it's not really a question, it's just in terms of the comment. I think actually what JR just said should be reflected in the comment, not quite in that much detail. But what I think people need to understand is basically we've already spent all of this money on the project except for this final $200,000 for which we will get $15 million back in return. So as I'm understanding it, and that's yep. I think what we need to, people need to make clear because it would be foolish at this point to throw the, all that other money away and throw away fifteen million dollars. So and if we don't spend uh, it, we also lose it. So right. No. So I so I yeah. think we just need to to be clear on that point in the comment. That's all. Other other questions or comments from members of advisory. Uh, other any questions from members of the public? I'm not sure we have any members of the public here other than our presenters. Um, are people comfortable voting this tonight uh, with uh, 
anticipated changes in that second last paragraph of the comment? I am. I am. I think okay. it's really important that the comment be clear. So, and I think our 15 views of it are probably the best way to make sure that it's clear to a range of people. So this is one I would like to see the comment before voting. Well, we're primarily voting on the recommended motion. Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. We can we can trust our liaisons to take to heart the comments that have made about that second last paragraph. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they would be happy to recirculate uh, the revised comment to us for further review as necessary. So I, I think it may make sense to vote this tonight mm -hmm. And, and then um, uh, when the comment is revised, we can all take a look at it and have a further discussion on the comment if need be. And I, I will admit, I was trying to be, um, I was so effusive about this project that I was trying to tone down um, my enthusiasm and being an advocate. So I, I hear, I really hear you. Okay. All right. So, um, George or Tina, do you want to make a motion? Uh, yeah, so I recommend that the town appropriate an amount not in excess of $200,000 from available re reserves for civil engineering services to finalize development of plans and specifications. Route 3A uh, slash rotary slash summer street corridor roadway improvements and all incidental costs. There a second? Second. Okay. All right, we'll come to vote by roll call. Andy? Aye. George? Aye. Brenda? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Dave? Aye. Libby? Aye. Alan? Aye. Vic Victor? Aye. Evan? Aye. Tina. Aye. Maybelline. Aye. Judy. I'm sorry, not Judy. Julie. <laughs> <laughs> Aye. And Aaron. Aye. Enthusiastic I eye. I was looking at his pictures across my screen. <laughs> All right, I've got it. We we wish Judy could join us. She would be a great addition to Adcom, I would think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for your confidence. But she'd so be I off the it. planning board. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> I got it is 14 0. Good job, presenters. Uh, Have a thank good you night. all for your time and being here. Thank, thank you for you. your yeah. time. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, Tayar, and Alan. And, um, got rid of everybody. <laughs> it's just us. <laughs> So uh, we come back to Article T, uh, the five-year school bus lease, and I think that's you, Evan. Can I just jump in to mention something that Tyler Buckridge is, is hosting the meeting for us. So if you look at the name and you're wondering if he's a proponent or something, you see his name, our, Tyler is helping us. Say hi to Tyler. Hey, Tyler. <laughs> Thanks, Tyler. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Tyler. Um, all right, Article T. I have to admit, I spent a tremendous amount of time on this particular one. Um, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about all the questions that Andy might ask about this. And then I went to the warrant article from 2016, and I cut and paste the entire thing and lifted it into this document. <laughs> so Article T, um, is the five-year school bus lease, which we had some discussion on with John Ferris the other night. The five-year period uh, from the original leases are up, and because um, the, of Mass General Law Chapter 30B, Section 12, it prevents the town from entering into contract for any more than three years without town meeting approval. This is up for uh, renewal. Any questions or comments? Dave Lee. So um, not, to, not to suggest that maybe we might want to say more, but one of the things I thought about when I was reading this is given the concern about finances and our deficit, 
and what do we do? I actually think it would be useful to include why we would lease rather than buy, why that's why that's considered in this context to be the better deal. So I'm thinking sort of about the financial, the finance committee part of being on advisory that um, what's the cost benefit analysis to leasing rather than buying. So, and if we didn't do it before, maybe we should have, I guess would be my thinking. They definitely did that, Davaline, because I think in the presentation that didn't John say they've they did said I mean, almost he, he did. a million dollars. So he definitely has that analysis. Because I always think about this. If I've come into town meeting and I'm somebody who's not really, you know, I don't I'm, we're not not as engaged as all of us are. I'm a, I'm sort of thinking, what is the question I'm asking? And so if I were buying a car, I'm you know, talking leasing versus buying. So that's what yeah, it may have value to just kind of have. John, give us some of that information for on the last lease cycle, um, how much they saved on the lease versus the um, versus the buy, just to show that it, it how beneficial it was financially last time, and that why they're asking for it again. Couldn't we just have a general statement that the school department has determined that there are substantial savings to be achieved by leasing as opposed to owning? And that would be fine. I just think we need some statement like that. Um, okay. Yeah, I agree. I don't think it has to be a big analysis, but I just was saying something, yeah. Well, John has if this, it, the, if this were the it. first time, I agree, but we're getting into round two of the five-year lease, so the alternative is now buying them. Yeah, I remember the detailed presentation the first time we went through this. Um, it's, it's definitely justified to lease rather than own. And it looks like uh, John is anticipating <clears throat> maybe achieving uh, further savings towards the end of this five-year lease um, program with, with the ownership of a small number of buses. In, in any event, Andy, you've got your I hand know. up. No, that's a, uh, oh, sorry. I'm okay. lowering my hand. I'm disappointed. Well, I did want to ask whether anybody would type out the sentence that was recommended to be added so Evan could cut and paste it, but I didn't want to be flippant. Well, um, I, I, I actually had to type it out, Andy, because it was a it was a photograph version of it that John Ferris provided me. So would you would you check, Evan, if uh, you see in the article, it actually says leading new school buses rather than leasing. Could, could you check if that typo is, um, well, let me check my warrant. Not the Wait one you've seen around the hard copies. Yeah. Article T. The change has been made, Bob. Warrant was leasing, Bob. Yeah, it, it, is, it should yeah. be leasing. That's the way the. Uh, we wouldn't want to be leading them. Yeah. Andy, this is where you say, can't you type? Um, yeah. No, I can't. Um, <laughs> All right, any, any other questions or comments? Kirsten. Were we also waiting for uh, an amount from John? W were we they putting an amount in the article for yeah. how much it was, or was that, did someone just ask that question? Well, the point of the article is just to, because it's a five-year lease rather than a three-year lease, okay. to give them authority to enter into that lease. Okay. Yeah, he could do the three-year without going to town meeting. And, and the money comes out of their school bus, their school budget. So um, it's it's already included in their Article 6 budget. Um, any other questions or comments? Everybody comfortable voting this tonight? God, I hope so. Uh, Evan, why don't you make a motion? Um, I just read the recommendation, Bob, right? I haven't done this since last Yeah, that's year. all you need to do. Yeah, I recommend that the town authorize the school department to enter into a lease for the purpose of leasing new school buses used for regular transportation. Uh, I'm honored to second that motion, Evan. Thank you, Andy. You're welcome. And and uh, uh, the comment will add the additional sentence we talked about. Sure. Yes. Then we, we come to vote. Uh, George. Hi. Brenda. Hi. Kristen. Hi. Nancy. <coughs> Dave. Aye. Libby. Aye. Alan. Aye. Victor. Aye. Evan. Aye. 
Andy. Aye. Tina. Aye. Davaline. Aye. Aaron. You're on mute. Uh, really? She got kicked off. She's having connection problems. But oh, no, there oh. she is here. Yeah, she's frozen. I say I. Guess we can't give her get her to give a thumbs up. She's frozen. She's frozen. Be back in a second. Oh. Yeah, that's right. Well, if she comes back on, we can we can grab a vote from her. Uh, otherwise, it's thirteen oh one. Okay. So that brings us to. Article U, the Plymouth River School windows, which we're basically going to defer a discussion on that tonight because the Board of Selectmen didn't vote it. I, I did uh, circulate um, the MSBA language that needs to be used ultimately in the recommended motion this afternoon. So people can take a look at that and we'll get a general idea of what the recommended motion would look like and it's my understanding dave that we are waiting for hopefully the schools to get a relatively definite construction price so that we kind of know what the actual cost of the town is going to be before the selectmen vote uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I heard last night. I didn't hear a lot of confidence that there was going to be a number that was very comforting, but that is what it is. Yeah, I I heard it the same way you did, but... Yeah, we'll... I'll, I'll write up the comment. I just got buried in other stuff today, but I'll circulate the comment, uh, you know, within the next few days, and whenever it gets back on the schedule, we can dig in. Okay, so that would then bring us to the 2017 Article B, 2017 school building committee additional charge. That's Aaron. <laughs> Julie, your dogs are so naughty. They're like these crazy children in my house. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's defer that until Aaron's back with us and do um, Article I, oh. Revolving Fund, which is Brenda. Uh, this is the perennial article that authorizes the building department to use uh, 350000 of their uh, proceeds from permits uh, for the purposes of paying for half of the salary of the building inspector, half of the salaries of the two administrators, and then the costs for the sort of fee-for-service um, inspectors and all their other general expenses. So uh, it covers 350000 of the building department budget. Any questions or comments from members of advisory? Andy? Yeah, I, uh, I, I think all of the revolving funds this year should be uh, emptied. And um, I'm wondering, is a substantial amount left in this revolving fund? Mm -hmm. and, and why don't we pay 100% of the salaries rather than just 50%? Mm -hmm. why, why have this money just sitting in that revolving fund, especially Statutory. this year? Statutory limit. Yeah. You, the, the, can't. Yeah, the fund can only be used for a certain purpose. Is the, and is the, is the statutory limit meaning 50% of the salaries, Victor? The, Why can't it pay a high? No, the town did an analysis, the, or the planning department a few years ago did an analysis as to the amount of time that different individuals in the department spend on um, approved act, approved meaning fund uh, uh, eligible activities. So there are some employees who spend all their time on it. And there, if, if you remember the budget um, for, I guess, the, the building department, um, they're listed as getting all of their money from here. Um, other employees spend a portion of their time. And I guess the analysis was that they spend 50% of the time. So for instance, the building inspector, the building commissioner is part of his time, and I think that's 50% comes from this fund because he's devoting that time to electrical and plumbing and whatever the other items are. But 
the balance of his time is spent on other things. It has to be paid through the general town fund, you know, town monies. So, so, so we are using the revolving of fund to the extent that we can. Is that the short answer? Yes. And, and Andy, you might remember, I think it was two years ago, they used part of that money to actually purchase um, vehicles. Because they are this year as well. In this year as well. Okay. So that, and that is allowed. So they, they are trying to use that money. Yeah. It's just how much is left in that revolving fund? That is 700,000 or so, Brenda? That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's just crazy. Maybe we can borrow it from the revolving fund. <laughs> this was Jim Sharkansky's issue each year. Uh, any other questions or comments on this? Is Andy suggesting he should vi we should violate the law? No. no. <laughs> he can do some pro bono to get us out of it. I, I had the same what, question. What's, what's pro bono? <laughs> exactly. It's what you're doing tonight. That's right. <laughs> um, any other questions or comments? Uh, uh, I don't have any members of the public here, but they're welcome to comment. Um, <clears throat> and are uh, people comfortable voting this tonight? Yes. Okay, you want to make a motion, Brenda? I would like to, <clears throat> except that unfortunately I don't have a printed copy in front of me. Does somebody have one and can they read the recommended motion, please? The recommended yeah, motion is that the town limit the total amount that may be spent from the building and revolving fund for the fiscal year 22 to $350,000. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, Andy. Aye. George. Aye. Brenda. Aye. Kristen. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Dave. Aye. Libby. Aye. Alan. Aye. Victor. Aye. Kevin. Aye. Dave Elaine. Aye. Julie. Aye. And Erin. Erin? Aye. Can you hear me? Yes, thanks. I, I didn't, maybe I had my head down the first time. Um, and I'm Aaron? here. Oh, Tina, sorry. Aye. Erin, <laughs> um, while you were gone, uh, we, we voted on the... Um, School, school bus lease? Yeah. I have an eye yeah. on that if I can vote, even though I was having Zoom issues as yeah, my. I think, I think you were there for the discussion. So, do you want to record a, uh, a vote in favor? Yes, please. Okay. So, I think that gets us to 14 0. And we deferred the um, Article B, the 2017 School Building Committee additional charge until you return. Thank you for yeah. that. In the words of my 14 year old son, our internet is funky, mom. So <laughs> apologize for internet being funky. Um, all right, are we ready to shift to that one then? Yes, please. Okay, so it's a pretty straightforward article. Essentially, this changes the charge of a building committee um, that was established in 2017. The original goal of that building committee was to oversee the projects related to um, Foster Elementary School. And this article essentially changes or grows the purview of that committee to include um, the oversight of replacing the windows and the corresponding structures um, at Plymouth River. Um, it's through a similar MSBA program. Um, it's an accelerated repair program. And the reason why this is in front of us now versus in front of us before was that we were accepted into that um, grant program in Dece on December 20th of 2020. Questions or comments? Um, I was just curious i was just curious why why do we authorize but not require in this one uh -huh. 
I, I suppose that's the way the school committee put it in. Uh, I suppose they could theoretically decide to change their minds and appoint a separate uh, building committee just for Plymouth River. I mean, I, I don't think that's gonna happen. Um, I, I, I guess we'd have to have somebody from the school committee tell us why they wanted that language in the article. I, I'm not sure it's worth going back to them over that. No, I'm not suggesting we do that. I was just curious as to why that was necessary here, but um, no. Well, uh, you know, Carrie, and, Michelle, Carrie and Michelle just joined us, so. Um, Hello, sorry. Michelle and Carrie, um, uh, Victor just asked a question on Article V, the school building committee article, about why the language um, authorized but not require was used. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have that in front of me. I know. Is that the um to give the building committee the authority for the yes. window project? Yeah. The, artic the I article itself starts out: Will the town authorize but not require the expansion of the role? of the 2017 school building committee. And uh, I, I suppose the question is, why do you need the words but not require? Well, this was, it did go through town council. So it, it was his recommendation, but I think it was because they, they work, uh, they ultimately report to the school committee um, because we're, we're responsible for, um, for all, all of the funds and the budget for the schools. So I think that's what they were thinking, but it was it came from John Coughlin. Yeah, and then you walked into a room full of 58 lawyers. <laughs> I know. Exactly. Yeah. I, um, I, I probably the explanation for tonight, Victor, is John Coughlin put it in there. Yeah. <laughs> John said so. <laughs> no, he well they well they never signed up for this part of the job. This is something additional we've asked them to take on. So, would right, it so what if they said no? <laughs> say, you know, would like you to do it, but not require you to do it? Well, I think that was, ex I think that was exactly the- All Right, well, I also do know that John Ferris asked the members of the yeah. um, school building committee current if it would, would be okay, um, and they did agree, so. I mean, have you met them? Of course they are, yeah. they're all about this. Okay. It would be like requiring Andy to do pro bono work. <laughs> say what? <laughs> I, he does, I don't care what you say. He does enough pro bono work. Um, exactly. Any other questions or comments on this article from members of the advisory committee? I have a comment you'll be surprised to hear. You should um, just leave your hand raised, Andy. It's so much easier. It's, the, the, it's raised. Yeah, if you could you get your eyes completely out of it so we just see the very top of your head, it'd be perfect. <laughs> Stop it. You know, uh, funky is, Aaron, is not the word that comes immediately to my mind, but it's close. But in any event, um, with regard to this comment, in the second paragraph, there's a the and a this, one of which has to be removed. And... Um, and also a little down from that, the phrase educationally appropriate should, should not be hyphenated, I don't believe, but apart from that. Okay, thank you. I'll edit that right now. Candy, it sounds like you're a wannabe editor for next year. Yes. I'm a wannabe a lot of things, but that's, fair. you know, as I, I once had a, uh, my one and only divorce case, the, after years of negotiation, we finalized it. And one Monday morning, the wife called me because the partner at the time was out of the office and said, uh, we agreed to share custody of the dog. And the dog's, he had the dog the week this weekend. The dog's supposed to be back at nine o'clock today and the dog's not back. I want you to go into court to get an order. And I said, look, lady, you know, there are a lot of reasons I went to law school, but going in a court to get an order to get your freaking dog back is not one of them. So, is that how you put it? 
I didn't say freaking. <laughs> I, okay, I didn't uh, talk. Com coming back to the agenda <laughs> item. Uh, <laughs> Uh, any other other questions or comments uh michelle or carrie did you want to say anything about this no i think it was covered pretty well with the board of selectmen meeting on tuesday okay. yeah so erin you want to make a motion Yes, I make a motion that the town authorize but not require the expansion of the role of the 2017 school building committee to pursue, oversee, and execute the replacement of the, so wait a minute, I lost myself here, Ex execute the replacement of windows, doors, and related infrastructure with respect to the Plymouth River Elementary School pursuant to and in conjunction with Hingham's invitation into the Massachusetts School Building Authority's Accelerated Repair Grant Program. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Okay. Uh, then we come to vote. Andy. Aye. George. Aye. Brenda. Aye. Kristen. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Dave. Aye. Libby. Aye. Alan. Yes. Victor. Aye. Kevin. Aye. David Lane. Aye. Julie. Aye. Darren. Aye. And Tina. Aye. Thank you. I've got a 14 0. And Michelle and Kerry, um, the uh, five year lease was approved 14 0. And we're, de we're deferring um, the Plymouth uh, River. Windows article until the Board of Selectmen votes it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the Department of Elder Services Revolving Fund, Article J. I think that's yours, Julie. Yeah. So um, it asks that the town will, um, it's a perennial, so we have to vote every year about the um, total amount that may be spent from the Elder Services Revolving Fund. And um, just a quick note, right now it's set to $80,000 and that was up to $80,000 um, at, at town meeting last year from 70. So it's staying at $80,000. And the Revolving Fund, um, as you can see in my comment, is credited with all fees and charges received from the Senior Center programs and pays expenses associated with providing these services and activities for the town's senior residents. Um, I'll note that I did not add at the end of the comment um, the language about the vote count about ADCOM and Board of Selectmen. Um, so I need to add that in to the comment, which I forgot about. Any questions? I don't see any. All right, any uh, members of the public that have questions or comments? Uh, why don't you make a motion, Julie? So I move that the town limit the total amount that may be spent from the Elder Services Revolving Fund for fiscal year 2022 to $80,000. Second. For a second? Second. We come to vote, George. Aye. <laughs> Brenda. Hi. Kristen. Hi. Nancy. Hi. Dave. Hi. Libby. Hi. Alan. Hi. Victor. Victor. Hi. Kevin. Hi. Andy. Hi. Dave Aline. Hi. Julie. Hi. Aaron. Hi. And Tina. Aye. I bet you school committee members are glad you only have nine members. Um, okay, I think that Seven. concludes our warrant article hearings tonight. Thanks for all the work that went into this. We're deferring the two climate action articles to a later date. Brenda, do you have any idea when they may be ready for us to hear? 
No, they're waiting for uh, Paul Hanyu from the Hingham Light Plant to get back to them about how much money they're willing to contribute to the project. Uh, Paul said he would set up a meeting with them for next week. It hasn't been scheduled yet, but hopefully I'll know next week when it has been scheduled. Once that number is available, then we can go ahead. Okay. All right. And we're deferring the, uh, the Hingham Municipal Light Plant uh, proposed transmission and substation project. As I understand it, the, the Board of Selectmen has not voted that and they are looking for the idea to be socialized with the neighbors. So that's what we're waiting for on that one, Brenda? I believe so. The meeting with the neighbors has been scheduled. It might've been last night, but it, it was taking place this week. It's actually happening right now. Oh, okay, all right. Okay. So that then brings us to item five on our agenda, which is Discussion of forecast, financial policy, fund balance, and override. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to ask uh, Dave Anderson to share his screen because <clears throat> we have a tool that was probably finalized between five and six uh, tonight. A lot of work has gone into it by Mary Power, by Dave Anderson, and by Libby Claypool. It's also been vetted by John Asher. And it allows um, the entry of different values for uh, different amounts, such as uh, the use of fund balance, um, the use of override money, uh, the rate of growth of municipal and school budgets. Uh, and I think those are the principal inputs. And um, be before we put that up, I would like to say that in my view, the purpose of this exercise tonight is for us to uh, focus our thinking on the concepts uh, involved <clears throat> that may or may not ultimately come into play when we need to establish a balanced budget this year. So there are a lot of moving pieces that are still going on out there, including uh, the, the search for additional revenue sources that could be used to reduce the deficit, the search for additional expense reductions that could be used to reduce the, the deficit. And um, the, the big question is the potential input of uh, federal funds through the Biden bill, um, which may be the major factor in helping out municipalities such as Hingham. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we may not have any good information about what that bill is actually going to provide as of the time uh, we need to finalize our budget deliberations. So what I would like to do tonight uh, is to have uh, Dave and myself um, go through uh, putting different inputs into this tool so that you can see the implications of different actions. Um, the inputs are being used in the context of the forecast but they are not intended to represent any um, course of action that is being recommended in any way tonight. This is a conceptual exercise to help people focus their understanding on the issues to be uh, ultimately resolved this year. And, um, I would respectfully request that people hold their questions uh, until the end of the uh, presentation 
Um, we can always go back and uh, Dave can put different inputs into the, the model and people can ask their questions at that time. But I think it's gonna be the best use of our time if we go through the exercise uh, first and hold questions until later. Bob, you could just say, Evan and Andy, if you could please not interrupt us until you're done, that would be terrific. And I actually have a question. I hope I don't sound really dumb here. But the Biden package, is that a one-time uh, number that's going to come in? That's not, an, he's, is he coming up with a number that's gonna be annually occurring or is that a one-time? I mean, my understanding from just what I read in the papers is it's a $1.9 trillion proposal. And I've seen something about maybe 200 billion being earmarked for uh, relief to municipalities. But uh, what the conditions are going to be, whether it's going to be like the CARES Act, um, whether um, it will apply to budgeted items or will only apply in some way to something that is arguably going to be related to uh, the pandemic. Um, the devil's in the details. It's probably going to be a 2,000 page bill uh, when it uh, gets to Congress. It's undoubtedly going to go through different iterations in the two houses. And um, I think that's the best general statement I could make at this point. But in, in other words, we just don't know. But to Tina's point, and the and really, it it, it is it will be impossible for us to spend that money in one calendar year. So more than likely, like the CARES Act, they will extend dates and deadlines for people who so because they didn't they, we haven't used up the first bill yet. I I I think you know we're it's not going to be a productive use of our time to speculate about what federal legislation might be. Um, I. I, hopefully, it will be a productive use of our time um, to um, go through this exercise um, and to see how the numbers change depending on the different inputs. I, I don't know, Dave or Libby, do you want to add anything by way of preliminary comments? Um, uh, and I would think about maybe the the, the function, quality, and inputs of the model? Uh, well, I, I can pull it up here. Libby, do you have anything you want to say while I pull this up? Oops. Uh, no, I think, um, I think it will kind of speak for itself. And I think that we should just, um, it's really meant to just see the process. So I think it would just be good to Nothing more to add other than walking through it. All right. Okay. You, I, do you see the spreadsheet right now? Yep. Yes. Yes. And is is the two point eight? Is this the farthest thing that you see? Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. Sure. I'm on the same screen. Okay. So, yeah, have to... let me just say one other thing as well, Dave. Um, yeah. I am going to email to each of you um, this tool. Um, I believe tomorrow unless something comes up tonight um, that indicates some revision of the tool is needed. And so each of you would have the ability to put inputs in and, um, and see what happens. Dave? Yeah. yeah. You may, for the purpose of this, since we, we can't see the last couple of rows, maybe freeze the um, the headings for the where the fiscal years are, just so that as you scroll down, we can tell which year you're on. Yeah, let me just, I, I will do that. Let me just orient folks and um, give you guys an idea of what's going on here. So yeah, Bob's right. There are really, in the background, uh, really no thanks to me or to Libby. Uh, but thanks to people who former adcom people and otherwise there's this model which is basically the forecast and it's a very high level kind of view of the impact of 
fund balance usage, potential overrides, uh, growth rates and expenses going forward, et cetera. Then underlying this is a is a considerably more involved model that also that kind of breaks down the actual tax implications of whatever decision would be made, if any, with respect to an override. Um, and as well as an override, but also a look at the capital projects. And so that is an, an, another spreadsheet that is in the final stages of getting um, uh, kind of proofread, if you will, and will be presented, I think, to the selectmen early next week and will also be made available to the town. I mean, I think these things, the intent is these are available to the town, not just to us. So, um, so with that, what you're looking at here hopefully looks a little bit familiar in Excel format as opposed to a PDF. This is basically the forecast that we have. This is the latest forecast. You'll note up here, the 22nd is the one that we received. And as I, um, I'll do, Libby had a good suggestion there. I will freeze this. And you'll see when I get to the bottom here, um, this number probably is unfortunately familiar to people. This is the current uh, projected deficit for 2022 under the existing budget. And, and recall that this, the numbers here in this forecast include the school committee budget uh, as if it was fully funded based on the latest uh, iteration of theirs, which is consistent with the presentation Dr. Austin gave us. Um, was that just earlier this week? Oh my God. Two <laughs> days ago. Oh my God. Two days ago. Uh, so yes, I mean, I, I think the most important thing is if I could, I could just take a step back and put on my ACEs hat for a second. I mean, the context of this budget, obviously, I think it, it has to be recognized is largely driven by the, the needs that the school has put forward. And we saw the data on that on Tuesday, uh, I think in quite stark relief and good questions on that related to the, uh, you know, obviously ways to work around, whether that's a full-time or a contract staff or what, how many years and so forth. And I think we all heard the answer. So I won't go over that again tonight. But suffice it to say, what, what's driving the four and a half million dollar uh, deficit here largely is, um, as we saw, a, a rather extraordinary, uh, as a, in truly in the sense of extraordinary uh, change in the school budget to accommodate the COVID impacts. And, um, and you'll recall uh, when Sue was on the phone uh, a couple meetings ago for us, you know, and uh, Victor pointed this out the other night as well, the the forecast, as we're looking at here, which you'll note here in particular, assumes that after 2022, all expenses in the current value shown on this page uh, grow at 2% per year going forward on the expense side. Uh, so that, as we know, for folks who've been on AdCom for a while, that is not a number currently that is consistent with a level services budget for the schools. Um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But I just want people to know that even in the context of 2% growth across the board in both municipal and education, um, what you find is that if I run this forward through 2026, what I do, you'll notice here's the four and a half um, this year, which we have to fix still. This is projecting a deficit of 4.5 million in 2023, 4.8 4. in 2024, 5.1, 5.6. I sum down here those cumulative deficits because obviously we can't run deficits. So somewhere we have to find the resources. And so even in this context where we, um, now this is when we've done nothing with fund balance, nothing with overrides, just to level set people. But if we did nothing extraordinary to the budget and just wanted to make do, we'd be $20 million in the hole at the end of 2026, uh, even based on an unrealistic growth level um, at a minimum for education and perhaps for municipalities, the municipality side as well, municipal side as well. Uh, just a quick note here, and, and this obviously people also who've been with us for a while in terms of budget forecasting, new growth here um, is forecast at 650. Uh, you know, uh, reasonable minds can differ about what an appropriate forecast is for new growth revenue. Uh, I think this is obviously intended to be conservative and, and that's not a bad place to start for sure. I uh, don't want to overshoot on that side. The two and a half percent increase is just math. Uh, you'll note when we do add an override amount here that obviously the override amount is a permanent change. And so you'll see a jump up in the levy from the override in the subsequent in the year following the override implementation. And then it will, as with every other part of our levy, grow at two and a half percent 
uh, until there is or might be a future override, in which case we'd do that same dance again. Dave, uh, yeah. for the benefit of members, because um, we actually can't, the cells you were just talking about, we can't see. Can you just scroll up and as you mentioned a cell, like you're talking about um, new growth and whatnot, can you maybe point into that cell? Just, we, we see it's, um, All right, there's it starts new with growth. dead exclusion. You, oh, you can't see above dead because, exclusion? Because you froze the, the header, just scroll up. Oh, see, I see it. You got the print up the night. Sorry, I'm gonna unfreeze. The freezing is not gonna work in Zoom. I don't think Zoom's that far ahead. Now, do you see new growth? No. Yeah. No. The top line we see is line 10, dead exclusions. I just didn't want you to get ahead of, you know, it's easier for people to follow if we can point to each cell. Uh, no, I agree. I apologize. I, uh, I Dave, think... we can't see your cursor. I'm wondering if your screen is frozen. If you stop sharing uh, here again. I'm moving my screen fine. That's the problem. I don't know what you guys are seeing. Um, we're, seeing uh, uh, we're seeing a stagnant screen. All right, let me unshare for a second and start over. Where's Judy Sneath when I need her, man? <laughs> <laughs> don't show us your bank account like she did at the selectman meeting. I don't think I'm going to do that. I don't think anybody would be that excited about it anyhow. <laughs> um, you want to roll, and I hated to slow you. There we go. Okay, there we are. All right, I think I'm going to avoid the freezing. That may have sent yeah. Zoom over the edge. All right, so you see new so growth. Point to get to new growth and whatnot, yeah. All right, so there's new growth. Uh, so again, you, you, just to give you some context, obviously 1.7 in new growth in 2021, 700 forecast for this year, 650 going forward. This year, obviously, is a, is a strange year, as we all know all too well. Um, here's the 2.5% increase, which is on the levy. Uh, this is 2.5% of um, this number, and then we roll it forward. So I, I won't get too in the weeds, forgive me. Um, so what has happened just for also for people's orientation, this cell right here um, in cell C18, if you're following on your program, this is a decision that's already been made by the selectmen to use some fund balance to, to plug a hole on what, they, what they've calculated to be certain temporary revenue loss and one-time costs. So this, this balance, even at the four and a half million, you'll recall from the other night, there already is some fund balance being used to defray some of the impact. So, so just again, to put in context, this is basically, you know, we're, we're not out of the woods even at a 2% growth rate right now as things stand. So clearly something has to give. And uh, the question is what and how many things. And so maybe the first thing we can look at just for, for argument's sake as we start to build this up is if you look down here at the forecast surplus uh, in deficit, which is 2021, currently we're forecasting 2.139 um, in surplus. So I don't think it's unreasonable to say that let's consider rolling that into um, 2022 and just push that forward. And so that won't surprise anybody. That is just a dollar for dollar reduction then in the, in the forecast deficit for 2022 which leaves us at 2.411. Now, if we wanted to, you know, we could have a number of choices. Let's take the next most- Well, Dave, just, just a quick comment on that. Um, that that 2.1 would ordinarily go to the complete fund balance, whether it makes its way to unassigned fund balance, um, we won't know until next December or January. And, and whether there will be a, um, a use consistent with our financial policy to use such an amount uh, remains to be seen. Yep. Uh, I'd also nice. like to say with respect to the $4.5 million deficit, as we saw tonight, uh, that's probably going up by $200,000 of fund balance um, use. Uh, because of the Route 3A project, and there may be other warrant articles. And then, then it might be reduced by um, some extra overlay or some insurance benefits. Yep. But for tonight, we'll, we'll just work with the 4.5. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, you'll, I'll get to the punchline here quickly, and I think what you'll see is that even this is kind of nimbling around the edges to a certain degree. So just to kind of complete the thought on fund balance. And 
Bob raises good points, and it's also important to recognize the total annual expenditures, which is a uh, component of the fund balance of the fund balance uh, financial policy calculation is going to increase significantly with these increased uh, expenses. So that changes the calculation on how much available fund balance and excess fund balance we have. But for the moment, I'm just going to add the two for the, the, the additional deficit and get us to a zero balance budget for 2022 if you wanted to do it all on the backs on the back of fund balance. And it's again, this is I'm not making a value judgment on this. I just want to show you where we go. So here's a balanced budget uh, for 2022. We can all go to sleep and be comfortable knowing that we finished 2022, but we've done nothing, you know, to fix the the the, the main problem, which is that 2023 and beyond are still a mismatch, uh, as shown here. And the the overall cumulative deficit for the out years is unchanged at about 20 million dollars. And I'll just say once again that that is also including a two percent growth in education, which is unreasonable in my view. Yeah. So, uh, okay. But, Can I just but, also say, note one thing, is that <clears throat> with, with rows 18 and 19 there, your 4.5 million and the amount above it, that's that's actually more, slightly more than what we've already quantified is is above that high, um, high uh, range of unassigned fund balance. So in a sense, that all be wiped out. I, I was going to say a number of things about using basically $6.9 million of fund balance. Uh, first of all, it's not consistent with the financial policy. Second, uh, I think what you were just saying, Libby, is that it brings us below the 20%, um, which is still within the financial uh, policy criteria. But um, uh, our information is that will be looked upon uh, as a negative trend by the rating agencies, uh, which could conceivably uh, trigger a change in our bond rating, um, which uh, could restrict our access to capital markets in the future and would at least raise slightly uh, the cost of uh, borrowing. So I, I think those are all considerations with um, uh, the use of that level of uh, fund balance. And it still leaves us with a $4.5 million deficit in the first out year. Yeah. So let's go to then the next kind of all in potential solution, which would be, well, actually, you know what, let's, um, so here's just another kind of all or nothing idea, which is to say, what if we just looked at the forecast deficit for 2022 and called that an override and left and left the only use of fund balance as the proposed one time 2.3 million. So if we run a four, five, five, oh, five, three, one, a nice round number for town meeting to consider that obviously does the same thing in terms of the deficit and gets us to a balanced budget for 2022. Now this has the added benefit, if you will, uh, through additional taxes of if you'll notice, for example, if you keep an eye on this cell right here, this is the tax levy. Um, and if, if, I, if, if you're not looking at cell D6, tell me, but if you look at the 93, 921, 938, that's a, that's a significant step up from the 89, 371, which is the um, unoverride, the non-override tax levy. So again, and the point I'm making there is just that the um, tax levy, as we've talked about, increases permanently as a function of the amount of the override. So when we look down now into the surplus and such, this looks like a forecast that maybe is more familiar to people who've been on AdCom for a while. Um, we, you know, we get out of the woods for 22, obviously is balanced, 23, and we start to get into the out years where you're talking about a cumulative deficit of $650,000, which is, you know, I, I think people could easily get their head around new growth, uh, potentially fixing that problem or, or some other solutions over the next four or five years. Now, the problem is, uh, for people who are still awake, is that this still has education at 2%. And so for argument's sake, let's just say that the education budget, remember, which is going to take a big step function up in this year due to COVID, if that 
budget was to stay at it as it was as it's proposed in 2022 and rather than grow at two percent was to grow at what i'll call a more the the five-year historical average which is closer to four and a half percent we now see uh, this line is unchanged so this we're not changing the forecast here where we change it is in the incremental expense so the incremental two and a half percent of growth in this case in the school budget in this iteration of the model runs through at a separate line item and then we sum the forecast surplus and deficit at two percent across the board with the delta and we end up with a revised surplus number and then if we do the same total you'll find that we end up now we're back almost to where we were before in terms of an overall impact where we have about a 17 million dollar deficit over the over the out years um, with a you know what was a four and a half million dollar uh, override uh, inclusion in 2022. Now, I, I can anticipate one question coming, which would be, gee, Dave, what does the $4.5 million override cost the average taxpayer? So if you'll recall, the rule of thumb is that about a million dollar in override for the average home, average assessed value home is a little bit of over $100 a year in additional incremental tax. So um, it, it's 100, the 10 year average, and this is in the second model, which we're not going to put you through tonight, but the, the, the 10 year, the first 10 year average cost per year is 128 bucks, uh, additional cost per every million dollars of overrides. So at a, at a four and a half million dollar override, give or take, you're probably talking about an extra $500 a year to the average assessed home value. And that is on an existing tax bill for that home or the, of about, uh, $10,800. So you're talking about about a you know 5% bump in the taxes due in on average over the next 10 years from the override alone. So obviously the 2.5% uh, annual growth would be incremental on top of that. So um, so you know we can uh, we can have a debate about the the impacts of a 5% bump in tax rates given the circumstances and given the needs at the school and elsewhere. Um, but the point being here that this this still leaves us with a problem. So uh, we, you know, we have there's more work to do. We can play with more numbers. Obviously, you know, if this number is not four and a half and is a lower number, uh, that helps things. If it's higher than four and a half, obviously that goes in the other direction. The municipal budget at two percent here, I think it's fair. We heard the other night, or certainly I think anybody who wants to think through this looking ahead will say, well, if we're gonna get an override, it would seem silly not to try to fix some municipal structural deficits at the same time. So perhaps a 2% projection for the municipal side is unreasonably low in the context of an override, but obviously adding, if I was, for example, to make that a 2.5% growth rate for the municipal side, watch the 17 million down below, it goes to 18.6 um, and obviously continues to go up as you move the municipal growth rate up over the next few years. So, um, you know, I can stop there. I can run scenarios that people have in mind. I can- you why, know, why, why don't you show that. education at 3.5, Dave? Okay. So now again, I'll run one thing here just so people get some context. I, I don't, this is, this is absolutely worth what you paid for it tonight. So I give you that caveat. But if let's say, for example, that we wanted to run this scenario, let's go to this. Let's say this is two and a half. Let's assume municipal gets a little bit of a bump, recognizing that this, I, you know, I'm not making any opinion and I wouldn't put, you know, Carrie or Michelle on the spot to opine as to the doability tonight of a three and a half percent growth rate going forward in education. I think we all know that is a hundred basis points or a full percentage point below historical average. But if we assume for a second we could wave our magic wand and, and make that change over the out years. And if we said to ourselves that, let's say we said we wanted to get this cumulative surplus to, let's say we can live with a $2 million deficit over this forecast period, just figuring that we're being conservative on um, new growth. And you know, I, I don't think that's a huge leap, but I'll let other people can debate that. But let's assume for a moment we can live with a, uh, a $2 million hole over this period, I will tell you what the override would have to be 
to get us there. Just wait one second. Okay. All right. So if if you if we agreed again with our crystal ball that we can find another two million in revenue through new growth, state aid, Biden bill, I don't know, fill in the blank. Uh, and if we if we could bend the curve on education to three and a half from four and a half, and even in throwing an extra 50 basis points to the municipal side, um, and took this 2.3, at least as this model is constructed tonight, and it's it's still a work in progress. Um, you know, a $7 million override starts to get you to where you would need to be. But the $7 million override, as, as I just explained, is, you know, what is it, $800, $900, $800 bump in um, the average assessed values tax bill over on average each year over the next 10 years. So, and, Dave, and an average being what, $850,000 house, right? Eight forty nine. Yeah, I think in that neighborhood, it's, right? It's slightly higher than that. It's closer to eight eighty, dollars I think. And I'll just make the point too, and I, I think you guys probably all know this, but this obviously nothing in this model as it's currently presented or what we've talked about tonight has anything for foster, uh, for a public safety facility, for any of the bigger capital projects, senior center, you know, all of those things obviously would be funded through an additional uh, override, well, not an operational override, obviously a debt exclusion override. So it would be a separate um, process that has a 20 year term as opposed to a permanent impact um, but it would be, a, obviously, it would be a, a, a cost nonetheless. And I will say that on Tuesday night, uh, we will show you a separate financial tool that has been prepared by uh, John Asher and Jim Taylor uh, and, and vetted by others, including, again, Dave and Libby. And it will show uh, the tax impact of different scenarios, both with respect to overrides and debt exclusions and over a period of a number of years. So um, we, we have some powerful financial tools um, in terms of modeling based on assumptions uh, what the future may be. Uh, and I'll observe that in my mind, um, we're not quite sure how we're gonna come out of the pandemic. Uh, there's likely to be some revenue recovery um, and, and, and maybe the, um, this analysis of finances uh, may in, increase the energy with which people look for efficiencies to uh, save on the expense side and increase the energy for looking for additional revenues. So, uh, Dave, unless you had anything else you wanted to say, um, maybe at this point we'd open it up to questions from um, the AdCom. Yeah, that's fine with me. Um, let me see. So, Kristen has a question. Yeah, I gotta get my participants list up. Okay, go ahead, Kristen. Um, so with this last scenario, putting in the override in at 6.8, if you went back to the 4.5 and put in a fund, I, I, right now it's showing no fund balance for the next, you know, it, right this year it's showing it at 2.3, which is even lower than last year and then nothing going forward if you brought down the override back down to the 4.5, but increased the fund balance, you know, 2 million and just went, at a, went across, does it get you to the same place at the bottom? And then it went across, like if just say, cause we're assuming no fund balance for the rest of the years. If you put it in an amount there for going across, does it bring down the bottom again? You mean keep going fund balance to the right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no. I mean, we could. I just don't, I don't know in this model, we don't really kind of have the balance sheet component. So I don't know if we would actually have that fund balance available. Right. Yeah. 
That's and we, we, we'd also have to have a use of the fund balance within the, the scope of the financial yeah. policy. Um, but, if, but if you assume that it's in, in, in 22 and 23, there may be yeah. some kind of one-time catch-ups right. pandemic related, that delay effect, maybe not all the way across, but to Kristen's point, you know, out an additional one or two years, what does that do? Uh, it, it, I'll tell you this. I mean, I think... It obviously it helps, but I will say that you know we've not a lot we, though. Well, yeah. it, I mean it, it helps. The problem it, the problem is is that we're you know we've added a perpetual liability and we're f using one time assets to try to keep up with it, and it gets expensive. And the and the you know the expenses are compounding at two and a half and three and a half percent, and our revenue is compounding at two and a half. So we're back to. You know, it's, it's a long way of saying that I think those are all great suggestions. I played with all of them today, but fundamentally the, the, the benefit of the override obviously is the perpetual nature of its, of its funding and its growth. Um, and obviously that has an impact on a taxpayer, but. Um, what about the acceleration of debt exclusions with fund balance? I, when I talked to Mary today, I, I, Bob may have more information. Mary, Mary, I, I think suggested that that, that wasn't a, a huge driver, but I'm happy to be talked out of that if someone thinks there's other solutions. No, I I, under, I understand that, um, you know, there have been meetings with the town's financial advisors and that we looked at whether there was a way to use fund balance for debt retirement this year in order to reduce our uses, and there really is not. There may be a small amount that could be a fund balance that could be used um, uh, next year. I think something less than five hundred thousand um, dollars, and it might be a lower number than that. Um, once we start talking about retiring debt, we we go down a rabbit hole about uh, when you can call bonds and how it affects the the financing and um, there's a whole host of additional factors that need to be considered. Hey, what about another override <coughs> years out? Yeah, well, I mean, that's Dave could put that in. Yeah, take out the fund balance. All right, let's let's go. Yeah, that's a good call. I mean. <laughs> Uh, well, we got a little bit of a cash flow problem in the interim, but <laughs> that we could probably finagle. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, that, that's those are all conceivable. I mean, uh, the politics is a whole nother question. At this point, Dave, you have in column C, what is that, fiscal 22? You have um, an a surplus of two million, so you've to, you have to change one of those. You have to change either the over, the fund balance or the override in that column C. Take out the additional fund balance. You need to take out yeah, the take additional out fund balance. Oh yeah. Well, I've got that. But that's legit. Yeah. Yes. You want that there, right? Well, yeah, we're, we would benefit from this somehow. This may just make up for this. Um, right. Yeah, because it's, but it's different fiscal years. But yeah. It hits. yeah. I just want to make sure we weren't like, yeah. Well, so, we, and, we, can, we, can get, we can give it to the 3A project. <laughs> what if we, and what if we did, Dave, like a six and a half this year and a 2 million in 2024? And, and again, you'll all be able to do exactly these things um, on your own. Thank I'm you. happy to be your Excel monkey, though. I'm no, I just... Well, I think, though, if we're going to, um, in my opinion, uh, just from experience over the past 20 years, I think that it would behoove us to, I, I do, there's going to have to be an override in the next few years, but wouldn't we want to coincide it with the foster override? Um, I, I mean, I, I just think it, it it's, good for us to go back to the taxpayers less times with more concrete 
number. I think, and I think it's unless you need it. I think Tuesday night when we uh, have the tax tool up in front of everybody, uh, you'll have a better feeling for that. Uh, well, also to Nancy's question, um, from what we understand right now, the foster override uh, and for the public safety committee uh, facility maybe would be fall of 2022, which is not when we handle budgets. So well, if we're trying to do an operational override, I don't think you could do that at the same time. Maybe I'm wrong. So, so as we pay off um, excluded debt, we're accruing that money in fund balance, correct? And is that is this model showing any use of those monies? George, I think we're accruing it in that uh, kind of reserve account we've built. And I, I do think this model is spending that down. Or, or maybe it's still held in reserve against what will soon be a, a new excluded debt okay. package. Yeah, I don't think it's going into fund balance. Yeah, yeah but it's going into reserves. Yeah. yeah. We're not using it in, in this. I mean, we could use it for um, operating deficits. Well, we uh, used yeah, it, it uh, last year it to, against uh, future borrowing. I, I understand. We used it last year to uh, balance, or the year before, to balance the budget. Right. It was the Haskell Amendment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was like twenty-five grand, though, wasn't it? No, I mean I've got the numbers here in the forecast. If you look at the next page on the Article Six detail, you yeah, Evan, you're right. It's um, twenty-two. It's one hundred ninety-six thousand. It's three hundred twenty-two thousand and twenty-three. It's three seventy-one and 24, 420, 428, and 25. So it's not it's not insignificant, but it's not it's low it's low to mid six figures. And actually, Julie, I just wanted to mention to your point is I I believe and I, I there's enough of you on Aces that can confirm this, but the special town meeting in the fall of 22 would be authorizing if it authorized the projects the debt wouldn't get floated right then. It's just, it's authorizing the, the selectmen to do that. So I think that if we were to remember back on that timeline that was presented, I don't think the actual hit to the taxpayer would be until sometime after that. I think it's 24 even. Later. I thought it was 25 actually. It's, for it's, 20, it's 25. Yeah. yeah, I think the, because it, 25, um, Bob said, okay, I, Bob. I think, I think you'll be surprised Tuesday night to see that borrowing a hundred million dollars um, can be done at a relatively modest cost, at least in my view. And I see Andy has his hand up. And uh, I, 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 I want to go back to the to the top. Make sure I'm not understanding how the top line in the tax levy is calculated. Okay. The eighty-six five hundred eight. Uh, so the 86508. So go is, back a year, Dave. If you if you take 82762. Yeah, I'm just, that's what I'm just showing you here. Can you see okay. the colors in 21? Yep. So 86508, the levy in 22 is a is a function of these values from 21. Yep. And that's going to be the same every time going forward. So the 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 levy in 23 is a sum of all these things here, including our override. Well, I, I guess what I don't, what, what you, so you, you to, the two and a half percent increase shown in 2022 is- It's, it's two and a half percent of the number right above it. And, and wh wh why is that? Prop two and a half. The law. Okay, but Prop how- Proposition two and a half. All right. So, so you your base tax levy in in twenty one was eighty two. Then you add in two and a half percent of the previous year twenty. That's the two hundred six nine. Yep. And then you add in the growth. And you add in the growth that gets you to the twenty the eighty six five in twenty twenty two. And then you add in uh, two point one is is two percent of the eighty two. Two and a half of eighty two. Two and a half percent of of no. 85 above the 86. Okay. Yeah. And then your new growth. Yep. Uh, okay, fine. 
The other uh, question I had is, Bob, what, what is, is your understanding of what the unassigned fund balance is? Yeah, if you look at the uh, fund balance memo. Yeah. Um, which Bob has right there. Which I never have far from my side. <laughs> I, 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 ha I have it in front of me, actually. Um, and it, it, you'll see that the unassigned fund balance is 3146446 Right. And the so unassigned, unassigned is 30... fund balance is 25.3% of total annual expenditures generally referred to as TAE. Right. So so you could you could reduce that to 20%. So and that would tell you how much of the 30 million you could use this year without violating one aspect of the financial policy, right? Yep, that's just math. Yep. And they okay. and and Andy, they the selectmen are I guess Mary have and indicated that number six million dollars is six point that, nine million, something like that. Yeah, six is, million is that dollar amount that exceeds the high end of the uh, financial right. policy range. Yeah. So if if you have that, and you have significant uh, non recurring expenses in the education budget, why can't you use that to pay the non recurring items in the school budget? The school has only identified roughly $400,000 of non-recurring expense apart from their hopefully non-recurring revenue loss. Yeah, I, the revenue loss uh, doesn't make any sense to me at all. I mean, well, the first time I, I asked, I asked uh, John Ferris about his revolving accounts and why I asked, why didn't he run them down to zero? And he said, well, that's just not how you do it. And then the other night when I asked him why the town should make up his $500,000 revenue loss, uh, he said, because we've run them down to zero. Well, last year, when we agreed to use fund balance, we were basically agreeing to do that <clears throat> on the basis of what was seen as a one-time non-recurring revenue loss. And I think quite frankly, some creative thinking went into uh, justifying the use of a hopefully one-time non-recurring revenue loss as a justification within the financial policy to use the 2.367 of fund balance that's being used. In other words, I think people went looking for ways to use fund balance within the financial policy criteria. Um, and that's as far as they could go. All right, I guess I, guess I would ask John, uh, John to take another look at the revolving accounts in, that the school holds <clears throat> and uh, use more of that money for other expenses. It doesn't make any sense to me that that sits in a revolving account. Well, across the board, um, any increase in revenue or decrease in expenses <clears throat> that can be identified helps the problem. I, I, absolutely. I, I can speak to that if you'd like. I don't yeah, know. Carrie, Carrie, I'd like to, to uh, give the ADCOM opportunity to ask questions first, but I'm very much looking forward to uh, having questions asked by you and or Michelle. Um, if I can carry into that question for me, Bob. I, I think there are other members of the ADCOM that have had their hands up that uh, I'd like to get to. And, and we can come back to uh, Carrie and Michelle. So are you, are you finished now, Andy? Yep, I am. Okay, Alan, I think you've been up longest next. Um, just for conversation's sake, I'm wondering if the tool or the formula allows you to change the total uses in terms uh, of reducing total uses. In terms of changing the forecast expenses? Yes. I mean, just, I would, I mean, I would think as a feasible part of the conversation would be 
maybe not doing entire budget I suppose, requests? I suppose it's a corollary of the growth rate. Yeah, yeah I mean, be, if I could put a negative growth, growth rate, you would just have, have it be a negative. No, I mean, no, 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 I, I mean, I mean, literally just not, just not, uh, I mean, again, not to be overly uh, contentious or anything, uh, just what if we, instead of a 10% school committee, school budget increase, it was a 9% or, you know, we spent 136 million instead of 137 taking out whether it's school or town or whatever. Just what if we didn't spend as much? Yeah. In 22. In 22, yes. Well, you could you could make the school growth rate 1%. Well, well that, I mean, is, is that what it would be? Is, is that because that includes 22? Because I'm just saying, I mean. No, you're, you're right, Alan. I could, uh, I mean, I could wing it. I, I'd rather probably just think about it and get back to you. I mean, I guess I was just noticing that the conversation is we're, almost kind of locked in on 137 million in 22, which may be right or wrong, but if we're, and we are just trying to figure out, well, where does money come from? Right. As opposed to the other side of the equation, at least being no, part of the conversation. I mean, I think it's a fair question. And I think it's, um, you know, from the ACEs hat, I mean, that's clearly something that we have more work to do with the school committee on in terms of just, you know, I mean, I, everyone's going to have their opinion about the, the school committee's budget. And I, I think, you know, I, I expect most of us agree that there's got to be some growth. Um, but your point is well taken. And obviously, the way this model works, particularly when the school is, at, is projected to grow at a higher rate than our revenue does, um, anything to reduce the amount of the corpus that compounds at a higher rate than our revenue is a, is a plus. So you're, you're absolutely right intuitively. Um, and, and we can we can certainly do that. But you're saying the way you would address that is by just changing that percentage growth rate? No, because that doesn't affect 22. And I agree. I, yeah. That's, I mean, I, it's not my model. So I think if I change a value in 22, I may blow the whole thing up. Um, it's, it's, again, I just would make the point that, it, that I don't think the conversation should solely be where, where does money come from? Well, I, I think would just add point. to that too that I mean we haven't voted the twenty two budget, so you know we we haven't at this point the one thirty seven hasn't been hasn't been voted on, so that's where the the you know the wiggle room is going to come. At least some of it will be there, and then you know. But as that's Dave, what I'm saying, that's exactly what I'm saying. I, I think you know I I would imagine yeah. some of this conversation is where does some revenue come from, and also. You know, maybe we're not at the full 137. Maybe we're at 136. Or yeah, I tried to indicate that in my preliminary comments that you know work goes on yeah. in in terms of looking for more revenue or less expense. So the forecast is is hopefully going to change. That's what I'm asking. Is this does this tool allow you to mess with that? I, right. I, Everybody protect themselves. We'll see what happens. <laughs> that change. Oh yeah, it did work. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that was at least part of the conversation. I, I've got another copy of the program, Dave. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I've done a lot worse. Well, it didn't change my uh, cumulative deficit, so something's something's yeah. not yeah, it's... happy. Yeah, we should do that offline, and then we can sort of come back to it. I'm going to I'm going to assign my selectman Excel monkey to do that for me. George, you had a question? Uh, yeah, Dave, I'm just looking at line uh, rows 26 and 27. Um, my understanding from the beginning of the conversation is 26 is showing expenses growing at 2% a year. And if that's true, why in uh, starting in 24 do the expenses go up 26, 27, and 28 instead of 2%? Because uh, the growth, I think, I think because, 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 this, we came, because yeah. school's growing at three and a half and it's yeah. a component of this. No, no, no. I think, I don't think those, that oh, maybe three, they're not in there. I see what you mean. Three affect that they're rows 27. Did if I you mention, go back, go put them back to 2%. Um, I mentioned this is not my model. Hang on. <laughs> if you put the, the yellow highlighted oh. and 31 and 32. Put those back to 
not 20. That would that would blow it out of the water. <laughs> Just going to make you feel better. It's all about contrast principle here. That's all. See, so row 27 didn't change. It's still 26, 27, and 28. Uh, don't you don't you have to click outside the uh, the the percent change boxes? Yeah, did it just change now? No, no, no. Um, no. I'll, I'll get back to you, George. Good question. Is that a calculation in, uh, in well, row 27 to 2.6? And Well, row 26 is not. That's hard-coded by Mary, so... No, no, 27. I'm sorry, 27. Yes. So that is, but but this is not. And, I, and I'm trying to think if it should be. No. Yeah. So, Dave, I think this is your model now. Oh no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, those those numbers are the same as the total use numbers in the five year forecast. Right. All right. So Dave, just for um kicks, if you got rid of the override in uh C9, yeah. let's get let's get rid of the overrides just to bring us back to where we were when we were originally and, and that one too. Yep. Yeah. You just want the happy picture. Oh. <laughs> what the hell did I just do? Oh, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I did it again. Dave, did you take the Excel class at the library? <laughs> I've unfortunately taken the Excel class of the last 30 years, so I have no excuse. Evan, you had a question. on the job training, right, yeah, Dave? <laughs> I, I, I do. You know, I, I love the tool. I think it's great. But it needs to start with what are we trying to solve for? I think, well, I think the key thing we're trying to solve here for is C29. That's the problem, C29. So that's what we're trying to do is address that deficit as forecasted deficit for fiscal 22. That's right. why we are we are doing all of this. Yeah. Yeah, but, but little of you, my point is you need to know the assumptions and you need to, you know, we live in this fantasy land where we tell ourselves we have these, you know, impossible situations where we never do overrides, we don't do these other things. So I think the tool is great because it provides tra some transparency around choices we make but the choices that we make and what we're trying to solve for are the point, not the tool. But we need to well, understand the ramifications of, of solving the problem of the current projected deficit. Yes. So this is a way to help us get there. Otherwise we're flying, we're, we're going blind. Well, and we don't really have a plan. Well, that, that's not the point of tonight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the point of tonight is to look at the tool. Uh, look at the tool, see what it does, see how it informs us. And ultimately, it may inform the choices that we make. And I think, Erin, you've got a question? Yeah. I mean, I think this might be a little bit about, you know, kind of addressing what Evan was saying. Um, I guess the way I'm, well, the question that I have, which I think I know the answer to is if we all, just for the sake of discussion, if we were all to agree to the school committee's budget and, and the 9% or 9.9% .9 increase, so just for the sake of argument, we all agree to that. Is there any way to do that without the override? that's fiscally responsible. Meaning, could we pull it? It, it, it? I guess, I mean, I think the answer to that question is no. And I, I want it to be proven otherwise, but I, I think that if we assume the nine and a half percent and we all agree to that, then we have to have an override. Dave, is there any other way that you get there, which without it? No, I mean, not, I, I think, you know, kind of to pick up on, on Libby's earlier point, I think I would expand because uh, I think she meant this too. But I, I don't. I honestly, when I look at this, and maybe it's just my own DNA, but 
this is this is this is a question to solve c29 how do we get rid of the four and a half but to me this is the real question there's g40 you know i mean what's the what is the cumulative impact and so to aaron your question that that remains the real challenge is that if you're going to add recurring expenses as we're talking about adding in the school budget you i don't think you can close the gap on well you, just, you can't close the gap on one-time dollars you have to do it through a recurring revenue source to try to match it up and that that is that and as in our toolbox the only other thing that i know of like that is a is either a new tax on somebody else or an, an additional tax on the people already paying the tax and dave i would just also i would concur with what you said is that you know it isn't just a uh, you know, I wasn't just taking this myopic view of just that yep. it's one year and that obviously we as a town and as a as the finance committee of the town need to understand that whatever, you know, whatever solutions we use in column C for this year, there are depending on what those solutions are, they 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 will have long term ramifications. So it's our job to understand how in the short term for fiscal 22. And in the next over the next five years, how those decisions will impact the forecasts and which ultimately taxpayers' property taxes. So, no, and I think that this tool is fantastic. I hadn't thought of it or looked at it in the cumulative surplus deficit. You know, whatever the uh, forty. You know, I, I I think that's very powerful. But I think again, building back on what Evan said, it seems like. I don't know. I, I don't see a path other than the override. And I find myself wondering if, you know, maybe there's some blend, maybe there's a staged um, approach to it. But if we're not in agreement on the assumption to date to Evan's point, it, it feels like we're, um, yeah, I don't know. Let me just put this back. We've never, we've never looked outside of one year before from a budget standpoint. And all of a sudden, we're going to show people $20 million three years out. That's just going to scare the shit out of people. I, I think we could do more damage than good with this. Well, I, would just, I, I would just say one last thing, which is what we've never been faced with such a large deficit. So it, it we have to, the sol potential solutions aren't just one-year solutions and fixing one year. They're going to have ramifications for the future. So therefore, we have to look out into the into the future. Anyway, I, I know Bob, you. Bob, you're the chair, and you were trying to speak. Yeah, I was trying to say that, for example, there is, you know, active consideration of additional sources of revenue. So, for example, if there's a transfer station fee, you know, that generates a million dollars a year, um, that makes a dent in this analysis. And it's, it's, I mean, that's one of the many moving parts that's out there. Um, and, and that's why, you know, don't take any of these numbers tonight to the bank, but understand what happens when you do certain things with certain amounts of money um, that you, you get consequences. And, and Evan, you know, we have always, every year in the warrant, given the town a five-year forecast. It's part of our job to be transparent, um, even if it's scary. Um, you know, I, I think citizens would be furious if they weren't told something that the advisory committee knew. And I'm not saying, you know, show them this screen tonight, but, you know, you use it to inform our decisions in the future. Uh, Andy and Alan, I see you still have your hands up. Is that uh, yeah, an I have, artifact? I have, I have one uh, historic question. The, the, look at the five-year forecast, the revenues, the actual in, in fiscal 20 and, and the estimate for fiscal 21 increased $17 million. And we're talking about fiscal 22, and we're talking about a, a huge deficit. Where, where did the money go? The new growth, Andy, in those in 20 and 21, new growth was real high. So I think that's part of the 
differential that you're referring yeah, no, to? No, I'm, I'm not talking about where, you know, the, 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 the new, the increased revenue came from the Ware River water system uh, in large measure. That was a $10.5 million. Um, but I guess my point is if we increased our total revenues by 17 million and, and our, we expended all of that money all, but how much did we put in uh, fund balance, 2 million or something? So wh where, where did that, all, all that money go? Well, Ware River is an enterprise fund. So that exact amount of so where the sources are above are in Article Six down below. So right, ten million right there. There's no profit on that. It's it's all, you know, it's an in and it's an out. The source and it's a use for the exact same amount of money. Okay. All right. That's that's the short answer to a large part of my question. Okay. A Alan, did you have another question? Was lowering his hand. Okay. Any other members of advisory? Okay, hopefully this was useful. I'd like to get to Carrie uh, uh, and Michelle. Are you still with us? Uh, yes, I'm here. Still here. Still okay, here. Um, maybe Carrie, um, you could start with the answer to uh, Andy's question that you wanted to offer concerning revolving funds. Yep, I don't have any questions about the tool, but I can tell you about the revolving funds. Um, the finance subcommittee has dug into those and put together a description of everything that's in it and the parameters around it. And we'll be happy to share that with you. As far as the question about the revenue, that is for the um, full day kindergarten and for kids in action. Because right. that we didn't run those programs this year, we didn't collect the fees. We have to have a certain amount in the in those uh, accounts to start the programs for next year, because they're they're very they've dwindled quite a bit. So we have a, we have parameters around both of those accounts. But so that's what he's looking for is to to make, bring them up to the point so that he can run the programs next year because we're planning to do that. Yeah, but well, I I love to I love to see that document and mm -hmm. and, and it may be that the. Um, um, it's, it's it's beneficial to put that as Bob was explaining uh, to, to put in the uh, uh, repayment of lost revenue, but on on the face of it, I mean, you, you don't need half a million dollars to run that those two programs to just start them. You you do because you're you're paying teachers and and employees for both KIA and for pre kindergarten. Um, they re they rely. These are things that um, rely on the revenue each year. So uh, you know, there's a little extra that came that came in in the past, and you know, and they did they did run run the balances up. And he'd started to spend them down, and then COVID hit, and we refunded the fees for um, for I think it was prorated for um, March 2020 toward the end of the year because those families were not getting the full day kindergarten service, and mm. then um, and then they didn't pay. They're not paying for kindergarten this year clearly. So, um, so they weren't able to collect the fees. But the program, you know, so the thing is, even though we didn't collect fees for kindergarten this year, we still had to run kindergarten. And so we still had teachers and all the expenses that would go with running a kindergarten program, we still had to pay. So he's been using the money in the KIA, and the, sorry, in the uh, full day kindergarten revolving account to, you know, to, to support that program. And so what's going to happen is it depletes it, and then we have to start it for next year. Did you or Michelle have any questions of Dave or myself or anyone else? No, I just uh, did. Did that answer your question, Andy? Yeah, it, it does. I like, but I like to. I like to see your analysis if you if you could. I, uh, yeah, absolutely. We'll send you the document. Thank, thank you very much. Um, okay. Uh, well, I will <clears throat> email this to everybody tomorrow. Uh, Carrie, do you want me to send you a copy? That would be great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, it's intended to be a public document. That Michelle, do you want one? I would love it. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Well, I figured Carrie would this. distribute it to all your members. So I, I wasn't excluding you, Michelle. No, no, that's totally right. Thank she, you. On my screen, she's on the opposite end. So I thought maybe you missed her, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's uh, you know, I, I get sent stuff. 
all the time, as you know, which I then redistribute to all of you. Um, and I, I figured the school committee was probably the same way. Um, and sometimes it's easier to just get one copy and then send it to the list. Yeah, um, that's, that's but, true. Okay. So if there is no further discussion on this tool, uh, we can move down our agenda. Uh, I object next... to calling Evan this tool, but go ahead. Gee, I must have somehow uh, misspoken. You were talking to me, Andy. Um, um, Warrant articles update. I don't know that I have much of an update. It looks like the uh, town pier article is still up in the air. Uh, whether that's going to go forward or not is, I guess, to be determined. Uh, I think the uh, uh, selectmen are going to hear the citizens' petition on deceased volunteers, uh, and um, in which case I'm going to have to uh, either assign myself or appoint somebody else to serve as a liaison to that article. Uh, if we come to vote on it. Uh, I believe on Tuesday, <clears throat> the selectmen are going to hear Article N, as in Nancy, uh, which are the design and construction bids for public safety facility. Article R, amend the general bylaw about the Hingham Affordable Housing Authority reporting requirements. Article double A, the 32 Rockwood Road transfer. Article double B, uh, the citizens petition to amend the general bylaws, which is the uh, gender neutral uh, language. And article Y, the uh, HMLP transmission and substation distribution facilities. So uh, I think uh, for the liaison's sake, uh, we would probably be looking at those next Thursday night. I think the selectmen are hearing capital on Tuesday. Is that right, Libby? Yes. And we can hear capital next Thursday. Um, uh, I think originally it was conveyed to the chair, um, Eric Valentine, that it was both dates were on the second because it's always been done on the same date. Um, and if you notice the most recent correspondence, I replied that I think, um, you know, that's typically how it's done. Would it be a problem for us to get it on our Tuesday agenda? Well, it's already Thursday night. So. I think Libby, isn't that usually because Eric's coming into the building? I mean, it's a, it seems like it's a much different thing to hop on to Zoom for. Uh, it was my understanding, Libby, that the selectmen, for whatever reason, um, were not proposing to have a joint meeting on Capitol this year. No, I'm not talking about joint. I'm not talking about a joint session. I'm saying... Oh, you're talking I'm, about have him leave the selectmen yeah, and then I'm come saying, see us? I'm just saying, as, as someone who's been through that, it's nice to just get it all done in one night. Um, that's how it's been done. So I'm not... And I did clarify that in the email today. I'm not talking about joint session. So I don't know if that can get on our agenda for Tuesday. I can double check with Eric. If not, he can I'll see if he's available Thursday. Well, I'll be sending out an agenda tomorrow for posting. So we still have time to put it on an agenda for okay. uh, for Tuesday night. I mean, okay. How does our how does our the agenda look? Is it is it is it already pretty full or? Well, um, for us for Tuesday night. I think we're pretty up to date. On our warrant article reviews, there have been a number that have been heard by the selectmen that um, we haven't uh, heard yet. Uh, Julie, we're going to be ready to vote uh, the CPC on Tuesday. Uh, yes, I wanted to let everybody know that uh, I've been in talks with Claudia Eaton from the Bear Cove Park Committee and some other uh, people who have knowledge of the project. And so there may be a path forward so we don't have to um, 
flush this toilet down the. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there, there, there might have some progress for Tuesday night. Claudia is going to come and J.R. Fry is coming to um, our meeting as well. And we can have a discussion Tuesday night of the uh, Asher Taylor financial tool um, that adds uh, the tax picture to our modeling. Or good so scare I people even more. So oh, I I think we've got a uh, Evan information is power. <laughs> yeah. Everyone should be scared. <laughs> I think we've got a number of, without intent, it's just data. We have a number of matters of substance to address on Tuesday night. Um, I don't know that I have anything else to say about warrant articles updates. Um, are there any liaison reports? Not seeing any. Um, I think advisory committee housekeeping. Uh, we've kind of already talked about the next two meetings. I, I understand that the date for the town meeting, the target date remains uh, May 8th with the fallback on the 15th and 16th. Um, outdoor meetings, uh, unless it's raining, in which case we'll adapt. Um, and uh, the policies and procedures review, uh, any idea when we'll be ready for uh, taking a look at that? Um, I think maybe by the end of next week or the following week. Okay, so maybe a week from Tuesday? A week from, yeah, let's say a week from Tuesday. Would that work with Alan and Julie? Would that? Yeah. A week from I'll, Tuesday. I'll be out that night. <laughs> I believe a letter has been sent to the governor uh, concerning the town election date. <clears throat> and so that remains uh, in process. Um, but the election date uh, is still looking like it's going to be targeted for uh, June 26th um, to accommodate a potential override should one be voted. Um, and I don't know that I have anything else unless people can think of something I've missed or have other questions. And um, I don't know if there are any matters not anticipated within 48 hours. And uh, it gets to that happy moment where I will accept the motion so, to adjourn. So moved. So moved. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Uh, George. Aye. Brenda. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Dave. Aye. Libby. Aye. Devin. Aye. Tina. Aye. Daveline. Aye. Andy. Aye. Victor? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Alan? Aye. And Julie? Aye. Okay, I think I get everybody. Hey, George, George, stay on for a second. I can explain that growth rate to you if you want. I figured it out, I think. All right. Good night, guys. Okay, good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. I think. I think the difference, George, is is that the growth, the two percent growth, is for Article Six only, and when you look at the the, the forecast, the the um, the total uses number includes uh, large, it includes capital outlay in Articles Four and Five, which are not growing at two okay. percent. Okay. So I think when you uh, you're, it's a little bit of a mismatch in terms of the growth rates, which and then the total uses number. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I guess everybody needs to leave because we've still got a quorum and we don't want to have a discussion. <laughs> oh, but we're having such fun. I'm going to thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Good night, guys. Thanks, Tyler. Good night. All right. No Good night. Thank you, Tyler. <laughs>